so good morning good afternoon and good, good evening to all of you who have joined from different parts of the world and a warm welcome to the third day of our lecture series a tribute to john conway a lecture series on the memory of professor conway today we are delighted and lucky to have stephen ulfram a legendary scientist of our time in our program and a very good evening to you sir Although he needs no introduction, but for the formality of our program, let me introduce him very briefly. Stephen Wolfram is a pioneering scientist, physicist, and author of A New Kind of Science, whose work created a paradigm shift in the cellular automotive research. He published his first scientific paper at the age of 15 and had received his PhD in theoretical physics from California Institute of Technology at the age of 20. In recognition of his early work in physics and computing, Woodfram became the youngest recipient of MacArthur Fellowship in 1981. He is also the founder and CEO of Woodfram Research, creator of Mathematica, Woodfram Alpha, and Woodfram Language. In 2012, he is named as the Fellow of the American Mathematical Society. And he regularly writes about his activities which are so like it covers almost every area I'm thinking on his blog, Full From Writing Site. So a uh, very warm welcome to Stephen Ulfram. We are uh, we are very grateful to you for giving uh, for you to agree to talk with us. Thank you so much, sir. Please uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Well, let's see. So this is, I gather, part of a series honoring John Conway who I knew fairly well. Um, I think we were interested in many of the same things, but often for different reasons. And um, the, uh, I remember uh, at some point being very curious about the origins of the Game of Life cellular automaton. And I spent several hours on the phone with John Conway, drilling and drilling and drilling. Why did you come up with this? What were you doing? And he kept on explaining it was a game, it was this, it was that. Eventually, I think I wore him down. And he explained that the real point was he had recently been hired as a professor of logic, which was not his primary field. His primary field had been number theory. And he wanted to do something interesting in the field of logic. And so he wanted to find a good enumeration of the recursive functions. And that was what led him to start studying things like cellular automata. And I was like, that's really interesting. That's much more interesting than that this was something to do with some game with Go pieces and things like that. But uh, uh, his, his motivations were, were rather different from mine. I think one of the places where, but, but nevertheless, he was interested in the question of kind of how simple rules, what simple rules can do. And particularly in kind of figuring out what can you make with simple rules. And so that led him to cellular automata. It read, led him to various kinds of number theoretic systems that led to various sort of generalizations of the 3n plus 1 problem, all kinds of things like this. Um, his, his goal, I think, was always, in a sense, a, a goal of kind of mathematical engineering in some sense, to figure out, given these rules, what could you make from them? Not what would they naturally make, not if they were the rules for some system in nature, what would they do? But what, with the cleverness of a human, could you make those rules do? And what I think is ultimately one of the most interesting things about the game of life, maybe I'll talk about this a bit more, is what it tells us about what humans can make from mathematical structures, what humans can make from simple programs. I think different from my interests, which have been primarily what can simple programs do themselves, so to speak. Maybe I, uh, I'll say a little bit about, um, well, both of those directions. Um, I would say the thing which I have uh, been uh, remiss in actually, uh, actually following up on, but, but to me, the game of life is the best example we have of uh, meta-engineering. What do I mean by that? In game of life, you have these simple rules. We know, you know, there are gliders, things like that, that sort of arise fairly uh, randomly, easily from sort of soups of initial conditions. But we also know that over the 50 years that the game of life has been out and about, people have managed to construct all kinds of amazing structures. And 
What's been interesting, I, I started a few years ago to sort of catalog all these structures that have been produced in 50 years. And by this point, people are able to make elaborate kinds of prime generators and computers and all kinds of things in the game of life using huge structures. And, and every so often, every few years, there's been an innovation made. You know, how to get streams of gliders to be deflected in this way or that way, these kinds of things. What's interesting about that is the same kind of thing has happened in physical engineering. When we look at microprocessor design, for example, there's been, you know, for a long time, Moore's law was, was out and about in an operation that, you know, every 18 months or something, the speed of computers would double. Why was that happening? It was happening because of all sorts of engineering advances of we can figure out this particular detail of how these, uh, these gates can be combined to make this thing or that thing, whatever else. But these were details of engineering, uh, which depended on the physics of semiconductors. But what we see in the game of life is a very pure play example of that. How does something, how does sort of engineering in its purest form advance over a period of 50 years? How do innovations in engineering, at what point is a, is a paradigm shift in engineering, does it happen? At what point is a particular discovery made that then has a big sort of fan out of consequences? What is the flow of the process of engineering? So I started to analyze this and I started to try to understand to what extent there were things like Moore's law, to what extent something like Moore's law might be a universal law of meta engineering as opposed to just a detailed law of the of the properties of of, uh, of semiconductor engineering um and uh, i didn't finish that study but maybe i'll talk about that a little bit more later and maybe i can um uh, but so, please hello yeah no um the uh, um but to me that's you know that's what you get from this kind of mathematical engineering now Another thing we can, uh, so, so then the thing that I've been more interested in is given these simple systems, just find out what they naturally do. Do things like look at all possible cases of them, do the natural history of these kinds of systems. And um, the, the way that I came to this, rather different from the way John Conway came to this, was in trying to do uh, natural science. Uh, you know, in natural science, what you're interested in, you look at what happens in nature and you ask, what is the essence of what's underneath what's happening in nature? And uh, that, for that, you try to make models of, of the natural world. And about 300 years ago, there was this big advance made to use the, to, the idea that you could use mathematics to make models of the natural world. And that's what led to the advances of physics and, and all those kinds of things over, over the course of several hundred years. So. Back in the beginning of the 1980s, I had been working in physics and so on, and I got interested in this general question of how does nature make complicated things? And that question is, is one that the sort of traditional mathematical methods of physics don't really tell one much about. They don't really tell one anything about that. And so the question that I asked is, how can we generalize this idea of making formal models of things, which is kind of an essential idea of theoretical science, that you have the natural world and you can make a formal model, a, a, a model that is, is, is just an abstract model of the natural world. Well, how can we generalize the idea of making abstract models out of the specific domain of mathematics to something else? And so I realized that one could start to think about programs and uh, uh, as models for the world. So then the obvious question is, okay, if we think that there are programs that are models of the natural world, what do simple programs typically do? What is the, what is the natural history of simple programs? What's out there in the computational universe of possible programs? And that got me into studying kind of the, the uh, uh, experimental sort of investigation of the computational universe. And, and I kind of viewed my efforts as being like, there's this computational universe out there of all possible programs. Let's kind of turn our computational telescope out there and see what, what's going on out there. And, and that led me to, uh, to start looking at uh, our friends, cellular automata. Um, and uh, let me just, um, uh, and um, a, um, you know, the, the, the standard setup, right, which I think you probably all know about, line of black and white cells. Uh, I, I, I came to cellular automata sort of 
independently of, I knew about the game of life, but I came to Cellular Automata actually myself as uh, an, an effort to sort of simplify the sort of theories of nature. And I actually had two models of what I was trying to achieve. I was trying to study two things, self-gravitating gases and neural networks. And it turns out cellular automata are good models for many things, but those are two things for which they are profoundly bad models. Um, but nevertheless, what I was interested in was take models that I knew about in natural science and drill down to what was the essential, what were the essential primitives underneath these models. And I had had the experience I had built the, the, the sort of the pre version of what's now Wolfram language, um, sort of the idea of Wolfram language is to have this computational language that can represent things in the world computationally. And kind of what one needs to build such a language is to sort of drill down from things in the world and figure out what their sort of underlying computational primitives are. So that was what I was kind of trying to do uh, for models of nature also is drill down what were the fundamental primitives. So what I came up with were these things which I later discovered were called one-dimensional cellular automata. And then I not uh, very quickly realized, oh, that's the same kind of thing as the, as the game of life in two dimensions and so on. But um, the typical situation here, we just have a line of cells, each one is black or white. And we have a rule here that says, given each cell, uh, what will what value will you get on the next step based on the neighbors of that cell so the thing that is uh, uh probably here everybody knows well you can um just start enumerating all these pos possible rules and many of them do very simple things some make nice nested patterns some you can interpret kind of using traditional mathematics as you know binomial coefficient mod two things like that uh my all-time favorite is rule 30 here um and this is what it does uh, there's its rule, started off from just one black cell, continue it, and here's the result you get. And, and for me, this was kind of the, my little personal Galileo moment, so to speak, of look at, you know, turn the telescope to the computational universe and see something extremely surprising. Because for me, this was sort of intuitionally very unexpected, that such a simple rule could produce such complicated behavior. It's a little different Again, it's it's a different objective than what one was seeing in something like the game of life, where a lot of what was happening was, yes, we can construct these things which follow these rules and manage to do something complicated like be a glider gun or some such other thing. So, uh, but for me, this was, this was something very surprising. And uh, what I realized is there's a sort of fundamental principle about what happens in the computational universe that simple programs don't necessarily have to produce simple behavior. And, and so I started looking sort of around the computational universe at different kinds of programs, whether they're cellular automata or other kinds of things. I started looking, you know, there's a Turing machine and um, uh, there's some, uh, I don't know, that's a register machine, um, recursive functions, um, even things like uh, partial differential equations uh, when you just sort of say, let's sample the universe of possible such systems, you quickly discover that many of these systems don't uh, show, show very complicated behavior. So it's something we, we sort of weren't aware of in, in traditional uh, science, because traditional science, we tended to, for example, in doing engineering, we always wanted to build systems where we could foresee what was going to happen. We didn't want a system where some very complicated thing would happen. We want a system where we can readily predict what, what's going to go on. So one of the things that um, uh, uh, many different things that you see in cellular automata, this is a typical one-dimensional cellular automaton, one of my class four cellular automata that um, has the feature that it generates these localized structures. And it's interesting, this is a one-dimensional cellular automaton. If you do something, this is the game of life, and this is a, a, a space-time slice through the game of life. And you see that actually the same kind of phenomenon of these localized structures being produced, it's the same kind of thing that you see in one-dimensional cellular automata, although it's a little easier to understand what's going on in, in one-dimensional cellular automata, where you see this kind of space-time behavior. Um, and uh, so, so you can go and uh, uh, one thing that happens in, in these one-dimensional cellular automata is that you can, for example, look 
you can start saying, what are all the possible structures that are produced? You just go and look experimentally at what possible structures are generated. Sometimes they're, they're things that are just periodic, sometimes they move. But then what very often happens is there'll be a surprise. So in this case, there's a surprise. It's kind of a glider gun thing that produces uh, uh, an infinite growth pattern from uh, simple initial conditions. And here's a case where you might have thought this particular cellular automaton was always going to do some very elaborate kind of uh, sort of organic looking thing. But actually, uh, for a sufficiently large initial condition, you suddenly get this very boring behavior. OK, so in any case, the, um, the, the thing that um, uh, one of the things you start realizing when you kind of explore this computational universe of possible programs is, even though the programs are simple, the behavior can be very complicated. The question then is that sort of studying the natural history of these things, like one might, you know, visit lots of different islands and find lots of different, you know, animals and plants and so on. The question is what general principles can one find that uh, dis describe these kinds of systems? And so the most important general principle that, that I came up with was this thing I call the principle of computational equivalence. And it has to do with the question of how do we characterize what's happening in a system like this? Well, we, um, uh, uh, we, we, um, um, we can think about a system like this as doing a computation. Starts off from some initial condition here, and then it progressively, successively applies these rules, generating some output. And we can think of that process of generating output as being like the doing of a computation. So then the question is, how sophisticated is that computation? Is that computation something where simple rules produce a simple computation, more complicated rules make a more complicated computation, and so on? The thing which I kind of realized is this thing that I call the principle of computational equivalence that says as soon as you get a very above a very low threshold, you immediately get systems that can do computations that are as sophisticated as anything. So what that means is, among other things, that predicts that when you have a system that isn't obviously sort of trivial in its behavior, that system will, for example, be capable of universal computation. Actually, this is a place where John Conway and I kind of differed. Uh, you know, actually, it was very strange because I, when I first met John Conway in the in the mid 1980s, early to mid 1980s. Um, I was talking about this, the sort of precursors of this principle, and he was like, no, it's not true. You know, you have to go to lots of effort. You know, you have these, these rules and so on, but you have to go to a lot of effort. You have to kind of do this mathematical engineering to create a system that is capable of universal computation. And I'm like, look, I think these things are just always going to be capable of universal computation. In later years, in a not uncharacteristic move of John Conway, he kind of forgot what he'd said before and thought that he'd said the opposite of what he'd said before. But that was some, um, but it was interesting that he, he took the point of view that no, uh, universal computation is a special thing and, and you won't get to it um, with typical simple rules. Well, we have uh, now at least two very nice pieces of evidence for the, the, the principle of computational equivalence from one dimensional cellular automata, rule, the rule 110 cellular automaton. Let's see if I can find a picture of that. I can generate one if I can't. Um, uh, where do we have one? Um, uh, there's a nice rule 110. Um, so this is the rule 110 cellular automaton. We know this one is computation universal. It's one of the simplest uh, uh, cellular automata. Um, and uh, um, the, uh, sorry. Um, uh, we also know uh, a number of years ago, I, well, I looked at Turing machines and I just enumerated all possible Turing machines and asked the question, given all those possible Turing machines, what's the simplest one uh, that could conceivably be universal? And it's this one here that has just two states and three colors. And uh, I put up a prize for somebody to prove or disprove that this was universal. And a young chap called Alex Smith um, showed that, in fact, this Turing machine is universal. So it's another piece of evidence for this principle of computational equivalence that 
any system that isn't obviously simple in its behavior will turn out to be as computationally sophisticated as it could be. And that has many implications about um, understanding sort of the prevalence of, of, um, uh, of undecidability in systems and so on. And um, lots of, uh, and, and it kind of has a, a this, this idea of principle of computational equivalence has sort of a lot of, um, uh, well, there's a question what one of the fundamental implications is a phenomenon I call computational irreducibility. One of the questions that you can ask about a system like this is, uh, given that you know the rules and you know the initial condition, just tell me what's going to happen a billion steps in the future. And in traditional kind of mathematical science, one's used to the idea that it's uh, uh, that 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 it that the, the sort of achievement of, of mathematical science is to make predictions, to be able to say, we can jump ahead. We don't need to follow each step. We can just say, after a million steps, this is what's going to happen. But the point of computational irreducibility is that in general, and it's common phenomenon in the computational universe, you can't do that. There's, there's no better way to find out what the system will do than essentially just by following each step um, by applying this rule. And in a sense, you can understand why that's the case by thinking about the principle of computational equivalence. Because if we, we are observers, predictors of the system, and in a sense, if we want to predict the system, we're trying to outrun the system. We're trying to be smarter about the computation than the system itself is. But the principle of computational equivalence tells us that our brains, our computers, our mathematics, and so on, is really no more computationally capable than the simple system itself. And so that's kind of why we can't expect to outrun the system, why this system must show computational irreducibility. So and, and there, there are all sorts of implications of this. There are all sorts of implications for understanding the natural world, for understanding what it takes to do various kinds of engineering and so on. But maybe I should, should say a little bit about, um, uh, talk a little bit about a couple of other things here. Um, not, not uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to talk about a whole bunch of different topics, and I, I'm uh, uh, be happy to have a discussion and see what people are interested in. But um, um, I'd like to go in, in a couple of directions here first. Um, one direction is uh, talking about, so what can you do with these simple programs? What kind of things can you, for example, reproduce in the natural world? And so I um, uh, was um, was interested when I was writing my big new kind of science book. I kind of started exploring all sorts of different systems, whether they're you know snowflakes or um, uh, understanding kind of the growth of snowflakes or understanding kind of uh, uh, fluid dynamics or understanding biological growth processes um, and uh, uh, finding even things like cellular automata sort of uh, printed out on the on the shells of mollusks from the dynamics of of their uh, of their biology and so on. But um, one of the things that I was interested in is okay, we can make these models of the natural world. We can capture the essence of how lots of things in the natural world get produced. What about our whole universe? What about fundamental physics? Um, can we use this idea of simple programs to actually uh, make a model of, of uh, the fundamental physics of our universe. And I, um, I, I certainly um, talked to John Conway about this and, and um, I'm afraid we didn't see eye to eye entirely on that topic either. Um, and um, I think uh, John uh, you know, did some work in, in recent years on quantum mechanics, which I, I don't think was really in the right direction. Um, but uh, the idea that of, of trying to sort of understand what simple programs can do, um, that's an important theme and that's something that uh, we both shared, although with somewhat different objectives. But so one of the sort of ultimate what can simple programs do questions is, could our whole universe be made from some simple program? And the, the to think about that, uh, we have to kind of imagine how that would work. A cellular automaton is, something where so so in, in the universe the sort of the 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 most prominent features of the universe are things like space and time 
In a cellular automaton, we've kind of already decided how space and time work. In a cellular automaton, we have a definite set of cells laid out in space in a series of steps. They evolve in time. And so in a sense, a cellular automaton, we've already locked in how space and time work. But let's ask the question, how does space and time work in the actual universe? What might be underneath space and time in our actual universe? You know, it's funny to ask about sort of what's underneath space, for example, because in a sense, in, in the history of mathematics, we haven't thought about space being made of anything. We've just thought about space as being sort of a background in which things operate. I mean, you know, from Euclid on, we just thought of space as this manifold, let's say, where, where um, this, this sort of continuous thing where we could just say, there's a position here in space, there's another position here in space, we can discuss what happens and so on. But the question of what space is, wasn't really addressed. And you know, you could say the same thing about material substances like water or something. For a long time, people didn't know what water was, that it was if they just thought it was a thing and it had certain properties and so on. But then, you know, 150 years ago or so now, people realized, yes, water is actually made of something. It's made of discrete molecules bouncing around. But for space, we hadn't come to that conclusion. We still thought of space as being this kind of mathematical background in which physics operated. So one of the things that uh, I started thinking about in the 1990s, actually, um, was what could space be made of? And so the main, uh, what, what I ended up with was the idea that space is just made of a bunch of discrete elements. And all you know about those discrete elements is how they're connected to each other. So you can think about this as sort of atoms of space, uh, you know, disembodied geometrical points. And the only thing we know about them is how they are uh, connected to to other um, uh, to, to other points. So, for example, we might say, um, well, we might we might have something where um, uh, you know we just have this, uh, and we can represent that kind of those kind of atoms of space as nodes, and we can make a graph, or actually, it's more convenient to make hypergraphs um, that show the relations between these elements, these atoms of space. Okay. So then, if that's sort of what space is made of, what, how do these systems, uh, what, how does time work? Well, you can imagine doing something a little bit like what you do in a cellular automaton. You can say, let's just say, whenever we see a particular pattern, particular uh, collection of, of uh, atoms of space arranged in a certain way with certain connections, we'll transform them into something else. Let's say we have a rule like this. So you can just apply that rule and you can say, what does that do starting with this initial condition? And you see it makes something like this. And, and you see again, that it's very typical that even from very simple rules, very simple initial conditions, just like in cellular automata, just like in rule 30, you get these very elaborate structures produced. Now, the question is, what is that? What is the limiting form of that structure? What does it do in the end? And you know you can you can just like with cellular automata you can look at sort of the exotic zoo of of different possibilities, but sometimes you get some clues. Like here's an example of a particular rule. It's another one of these very simple rules. There's the specification of the rule. Um, this is what that rule does when you just keep applying it. And if you keep applying it long long enough you see that it's forming this thing. So remember, what I'm showing here are just graphs, and the, there's nothing that's predefined about the positions of nodes in this graph. It's all that we know about is how they're connected, and the layout is just for the convenience of the human observer. So what we see here is that that particular uh, rule effectively knits a two-dimensional manifold. It knits something which limits to two-dimensional Euclidean space. And with a different rule, you know, we might have another rule here. It knits something more complicated. Here's an example of a rule where the thing that you get out in the end um, is something that looks much like, uh, you know, when you just render it like this, it looks like a curved two-dimensional surface. Well, so first question is, given these simple rules, uh, what kinds of, that are sort of making space, what kind of space can they make? So we can kind of characterize things. We, you know, if we, if we take a given sort of connectivity of nodes, we can draw them in lots of different ways, but we can try and find a sort of more robust characterization. For example, we can say, what's the effective dimension of the limiting space that we get? And we can measure that by just saying, start from a given node and just go, 
our nodes away from that node in the graph, how many nodes do we get? We build a geodesic ball of nodes and we just ask how rapidly does that geodesic ball grow with R? So in general, if we're in something which is sort of behaving like two dimensional space, it'll grow like R squared, three dimensional space, it'll grow like R cubed. In general, we can say it grows like R to the D and we can say that gives us a characterization of the effective dimension of this limiting structure built by applying these simple rules. And uh, we, can, we can actually make measurements of these things. So we can just ask how big do these geodesic balls get? We can measure dimension. We could say, for example, we can make something, this is an example of a rule that makes a sort of recognizable fractal kind of thing. And we can measure the dimension there and find out it's the standard uh, uh, fractal dimension and so on. Um, so this gives us a characterization of what this limiting space looks like. Now, in fact, there's a little bit more that we can get out of it than just saying what's the dimension. If we look at the growth rate of this geodesic ball, the leading order term is R to the D. There's a subleading term, which is depends on the curvature of that space. And so it's proportional to the Ricci scalar curvature from differential geometry. And um, we can, uh, uh, it's just like, you know, if we draw a circle on a sphere, the, the area of the circle is not exactly pi r squared. It has a correction term that depends on the on the uh, radius of the of the big sphere, so to speak. So we can we can start to characterize not just the 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 effective dimension of our limiting uh, hypergraphs, but also their effective curvature. And um, so then, well, the big fact is if we look at the the time evolution of that effective curvature. And I have to say a little bit about what we even mean by time evolution. But if we look at the sort of evolution of those things, it turns out that the sort of continuum limit follows the Einstein equations. So, you know, I discovered some simple cellular automata where with certain low level conservation laws in the large scale limit, the cellular automata uh, will show behavior that corresponds to fluid dynamics. In this case, these hypergraph rewriting systems their large scale limit is not fluid dynamics, it's the Einstein equations for the structure of space time. Now, what, one thing that's a bit surprising if, uh, the, for physics folk particularly is in these models, space is, is dealt with in terms of this sort of extension of the spatial hypergraph, but time is a very different kind of thing from space. Time is described by this sort of uh, progressive computational process of rewriting um, the, uh, the 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 structure of the spatial hypergraph, and um, the uh, the thing that um, uh, and so it's not an obvious fact that you would get something like relativity with its standard relationship between space and time. Basically, what happens is that as soon as you are you as an observer are embedded within the system, you realize the only thing you can actually be sensitive to is the the network of causal relationships between updating events. So we can we can look at um, uh, one of these systems and we can say, oh, it's got. Um, uh, let's see, where do I have an example? Um, we're we're looking at these different little updating events that are occurring in this network, and we're asking what is the what uh, what is the what are the causal relationships between those updating events? One of these updating events involves certain edges in this network. That updating event uh, can affect other updating events. There's a network of there's a graph that shows how one updating event affects other updating events. That's a a causal graph that represents that that relationship. Now let's take a simpler case. Let's look at just a, a string of A's and B's. And our rule here is just BA goes to AB. Well, these yellow things represent the, the events that correspond to those updates. And we can draw this graph that shows what is the set of causal relationships between those events. This event can't happen unless the output from this event is already available and so on. Well, okay, so then sort of the, a big fact is this thing we call causal invariance, which is a property of certain rewrite rules that causes it to be the case that even though the underlying, uh, even though we can sort of choose which update to do when, the network of causal relationships between updating events is always the same. And it turns out that that phenomenon is what gives us relativity um, and that, uh, that uh, we can kind of 
uh, we can start thinking about how do we characterize this network of updating events and how do we say what corresponds to simultaneity in time, we can start making these foliations of this causal graph. And then we can say, well, let's choose a different foliation. Let's choose a foliation uh, which corresponds to a different reference frame. And we can then see that uh, it turns out that all the standard results of relativity apply um, about this. And one, one thing that's perhaps interesting to see is when, so one, one common phenomenon in relativity is time dilation. And uh, it's perhaps interesting to see where do I have a good example of that. Um, let's look at this case here. So this is a reference frame in which basically as much as possible is getting updated at the same time. And we could think of it as being, we're just staying in one place and we're keeping on updating things. But let's imagine that instead we have a reference frame in which we're actually moving in this space as well as, as, well as doing this updating. If we want to move in the space, we make a reference frame which is tilted in this space. And so what we see here is, is basically the classic relativistic phenomenon of time dilation. It takes longer to get to the result because we are basically moving in space at the same time as this computation is happening. Kind of the, the way to understand time dilation is if you are an observer operating inside this kind of computational universe, you, um, you have a certain sort of computational budget. You can either use that budget to... Uh, do computations at a particular place in space, or you can use some of that budget to move and sort of update yourself in different places in space, in which case you have less budget to use for the evolution and time appears to run more slowly as a result. One thing I should explain is that in these models, uh, the, uh, the sort of the only thing that exists in the universe is space. So it's like in a cellular automaton like rule 110, the only thing that exists is just the pattern of, of, of cells here. But in, in the rule 110 cellular automaton, we can see there are these particle-like structures that arise that have all kinds of complicated dynamics. What we imagine is that in the universe, the same kind of thing happens with the particles like electrons and quarks and so on that we know that those are essentially the same kind of topological defects in the structure of space that these particles are in the pattern of the background here. And one of the things that's sort of a challenge in our physics project right now is understanding what the analog of these kinds of particle-like structures in this updating hypergraph actually are. And it's a big adventure in, in kind of generalizing differential geometry. One of the things that happens in these, in these hypergraphs is that you can construct these kinds of things like parallel transport and, and fiber bundles and all kinds of other, all kinds of other things but they're a bit different from the way they work even in discrete differential geometry because uh, in, in standard sort of calculus-based approaches to things, you always have an integer number of variables. Whereas in this, you know, you're, you're doing calculus in one variable, two variables, whatever. What we need here is something that goes below the notion of variables and essentially is a sort of a generalization of calculus that works with fractional numbers of variables or something that sort of goes below, below the idea of variables. So that's kind of the, the challenge that exists there. Well, so, so in any case, we can, um, uh, we can look at all these features of, of sort of space time that emerge from these, these uh, uh, rewritings of hypergraphs and so on. One of the things that's a feature of the rewriting of these hypergraphs is that uh, all the rule says is when you see a little piece of hypergraph that looks like this, rewrite it to be something that looks like that. It doesn't tell you in what order or where to do these things. And this is a big difference from cellular automata. Cellular automata, we're dealing with sort of synchronous updates where every cell is updated at the same time in sort of lockstep. But in these models, we're just saying update wherever you feel like. And the result of that is that we get this multi-way graph that represents the, all possible updating. So here's the initial condition. These are two possible out, outputs from that initial condition. These are more outputs from there and so on. We build up this multi-way graph that involves branching where one state can turn into many and also merging where many states can merge into an identical final state. So what is the significance of this multi-way graph? Well, basically the significance is it gives us quantum mechanics. In, in classical physics, the sort of the big point is things do definite stuff. So, you know, you throw a ball, it goes on a definite trajectory. In quantum mechanics, kind of the idea is that uh, you 
are saying things follow many possible paths and we only get to say what the probabilities of different outcomes are. Well, that's an inevitable feature of these models because what's happening here is that there are these many possible paths and these correspond to what happens in quantum mechanics. So I can, I can fill in a little bit more detail. One of the things to understand is um, when we look at um, these, um, if we look at these multi-way graphs, we can ask the question, how do we lay out these different states that exist here? How are they, how are they related to each other? Uh, can we think of them as, as living in some kind of space? Well, it turns out we can, we call it branchial space, the space of quantum branches. And essentially what happens is you can make a map of, of sort of where these things are in space by asking which ones have common ancestors. And whenever they have common ancestors, you join them. So this is an example of, of successive slices in the multi-way graph, successive slices in time, showing the branchial relationships between different states in the multi-way graph. So this is essentially a map of, actually it's a map of quantum entanglements. It's a map of entanglements between states induced by the structure of the multi-way graph. Okay, so, so what is this? This is something, it's not like physical space. It's not like a layout of, of sort of physical space. It's a, it's a space of quantum entanglements, but it's a space in which we can also think about motion, just as we can think about motion in physical space. In physical space, we think about GD6 as being the paths that, that particles will take in physical space. And when, when space is curved, those paths will be curved and that corresponds to the force of gravity and so on. And the description of the deflection of those paths is the story of the Einstein equations in physical space. Well, it turns out we can do the same exact kind of thing in branchial space. There is a direct analog of the equations of geodesic def deflection, so to speak, in branchial space. But now, what are those equations? Those equations turn out to correspond to a core feature of quantum mechanics. They're basically the Feynman path integral. Uh, and it tells one how these GD6 in the multi-way graph are deflected by the presence of energy in the same way that one's deflected by the presence of mass energy in, um, uh, in physical space. And so the, the remarkable realization is that in these models, the sort of the structure of space-time, the Einstein equations are the same, they come from the same place as the path integral of quantum mechanics. So in a sense, general relativity and quantum mechanics are the same theory, except general relativity is operating in physical space and quantum mechanics is operating in this branchial space in multi-way graphs. So that's kind of a, a big deal in this sort of theory of physics. And uh, there's, there's a lot that can be said about kind of um, uh, quantum measurement. I think John Conway worked on this, he had this quantum free will idea, which I think didn't quite go in the right direction. Um, I think that the, the story of quantum measurement is, is a story of, um, uh, of reference frames. Um, basically, in the, in the, um, uh, the multi-way graph, you are forming a foliation, and you're essentially defining, when you make a quantum measurement, you're essentially defining a reference frame. And it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit of a bizarre thing, because what's happening is uh, we, as observers of this quantum system, are... Well, we as observers are actually embedded in the quantum system. So the quantum system is full of these branches. Our brains effectively are branching in the same way as the system itself is branching. So sort of the story of quantum measurement is a story of how does a branched brain perceive a branching universe? And you can kind of untangle that using a bunch of methods actually from automated theorem proving um, that's the sort of a directly analogous kind of system. That the, the reason it's analogous is you look at this multi-way graph, you can imagine that each one of these nodes is an expression, a mathematical expression, and each edge corresponds to the application of some axiom that transforms that expression. And so a theorem that some expression is equal to some other expression becomes the statement there is a path in the multi-ray graph from one, uh, from one node, from one expression to another one. And uh, so then, then these questions about quantum measurement end up being questions about making completions and lemmas and so on in this kind of... Uh, um, in this in this graph that you get. Well, okay. So I mean, there's there's uh, uh, what I what I find interesting is is that um, uh, from this sort of idea of simple rules, we're getting this sort of fundamental uh, approach to physics. It's turning out that the formalism that we have for physics is also applicable to a bunch of other areas too. Um, it's applicable 
uh, well, it's certainly applicable to distributed computing because what we have here, just as cellular automata are the minimal models of, of synchronous parallel computation, these models are essentially the minimal models of asynchronous distributed computation. And so it's been very difficult for us to understand sort of how do we do programming in, um, uh, in distributed computation. I think that the, we can learn a lot from physics about that. We can learn about sort of programming in reference frames and, and things like this. There's, there's lots to say about that. Um, there are also other areas where the formalism of our physics project seems to be very relevant, um, particularly where well, it's relevant to metamathematics it's relevant to making kind of a, you know, in, if we look at mathematical theorems that have been uh, studied in the history of mathematics, there's a few million of such theorems and they have, they form this big sort of uh, a multi-way graph type network of what theorem can be proved from what other theorem. And there's sort of a question then of what, um, what the overall structure of that multi-way graph, what the overall structure of metamathematics is, what the limit of mathematics is. You know, mathematics, we think about particular theorems, but if we think about the network of all possible theorems, what is the limit as you take that to sort of the continuum limit? And how does that continuum limit compare to the continuum limit of, of physics and features like space and time? And actually, I've just been figuring out a bunch of this, and I, I, it requires me going into a couple more layers of, of abstraction here which I'm not sure people, uh, I'm not quite sure whether this is what people here will be interested in, but um, uh, a, a very recent realization. So, so well, let's see. There's, there's a bunch that one can say about kind of what, and when you try and make a theory of physics, one of the questions is, you might say, well, in the end, our universe is based on this particular rule for updating hypergraphs. But you say, well, why that rule and not another rule? Well, what you realize is, you can sort of go multi-way, but even more extremely, you can make what we call a ruleal multi-way system, where in addition to saying we apply the rule at every place we could apply the rule, we, we also say we apply all rules we could imagine applying. So we apply all possible rules. And so we get this thing, which is this ruleal multi-way graph, which is this very complicated structure, but it's a complicated structure which has which uh, you might think, oh, if we apply all possible rules, how can we ever say anything? Why, why isn't that just going to be have no structure at all? But it turns out it has a very, uh, a very interesting structure. And we can look, um, let me just pull up something here. Um, we can look at, for example, for, um, uh, this is a, a study I did about uh, Turing machines and, um, uh, the ruleal space of Turing machines. So there's just an ordinary Turing machine. There's what it does. We can consider a non-deterministic Turing machine where from a single initial state, it can generate multiple states. And what we can do then is we can consider a ruleal Turing machine in which it applies all possible Turing machine rules. And so what we get here is this kind of ruleal graph, that, the, this ruleal multi-way graph that represents the sort of ultimately non-deterministic Turing machine that's doing all the possible things a Turing machine can do. But that graph has a definite structure because states that are generated, there may be branches, but they're also mergers. And so what we end up with in the end is, is we actually get very definite structures from these uh, ruleal multi-way graphs. Um, and these sort of represent the, the, the sort of full structure of all possible sort of abstract Turing machines. And it's kind of interesting, I might make the comment that in a sense, this is a story of deterministic versus non-deterministic computation. If one's interested in like the P versus NP problem, what one sees in this, in this space of this ruleal multi-way system, a particular Turing machine evolution is just this one path. But in a sense, this, this whole structure represents what you can reach with all possible non-deterministic Turing machines. And so the question of things like P versus MP becomes a geometrical question about what, how do you compare this kind of ruleal graph with what you can reach with all possible deterministic individual paths? And, and I might say that, that um, uh, so in any case, there's this, this ruleal graph has a very definite structure and that structure is kind of the ultimate limit of physics. It's the ultimate limit of, of uh, and, and that graph, well, it has, it has many interpretations. That graph is both the ultimate limit of physics 
in this kind of uh, all possible rules are being run. But the fact that, well, so, so then what happens is there's a kind of uh, a relativistic invariance that causes different reference frames in real space to all conclude the same kinds of things. And in a sense, we as sort of observers of this real universe are picking out a particular reference frame and observing particular things. Okay, so one of the surprising things is the ultimate limit of physics is the same as the ultimate limit of mathematics. Both are the, essentially these real multiway systems that correspond to the application of all possible uh, sort of formal rules. In mathematics, this real multiway system has been studied a bit. It's a limit of higher category theory, this thing called the infinity groupoid, studied by people like Grothendieck. And so the strange thing that happens is the, the ultimate limit of physics is the same as the ultimate limit of mathematics. And we can start to uh, talk about lots of different features of mathematics um, in, in close analogy to features of physics in that way. And I've, I've just been exploring this actually, and it's kind of a, a um, actually it's today's project um, had to do with trying to understand uh, this question of, of sort of the platonic uh, view of mathematics, of mathematics as a definite thing that exists, as opposed to something we choose to construct from, um, from particular axiom systems. And I think that um, by thinking in these ways, uh, one can understand sort of the, the mathematics exists in the same way that the physical universe exists. So lo lots of things to say about that. But um, uh, I think maybe I can um, uh, can talk a little bit. Well, there's there's some um, uh, what what we're realizing is that this idea of simple programs uh, producing complicated behavior, leading us to things like computational irreducibility, principle of computational equivalence. That's an important strand of development. The, another strand of development that we've learned is that. One of the surprises then is, okay, if the universe is like this and is full of computational irreducibility, how come there are any laws of the universe that we can identify? How come there are any things that we can say about the universe? And this is a place where the, the sort of a surprising thing that there are these slices of computational reducibility within any computationally irreducible system. And those slices of computational reducibility turn out to correspond to laws of physics that we know. And so th this, this kind of question of how do you identify, how do you generically identify slices of computational reducibility within computationally irreducible systems? This is an interesting question. This is something that um, I think is leading us to sort of a, a really new understanding of how, uh, how systems of simple, how simple programs, simple rules and so on, how that really works. We both have this, this layer of computational irreducibility on top of that, we can have these slices of computational reusability. And those are the things that we humans kind of lock into when we try and make sense of the physical universe. And I think it's gonna turn out that that idea of, um, uh, of kind of finding these slices of computational reducibility, it's gonna turn out that that is actually what's needed to crack a whole bunch of problems in a whole bunch of areas of science and elsewhere that have been kind of uh, long running issues. Um, I just mentioned, uh, well, you can, you can apply this kind of thinking to lots of different kinds of things. I've been recently thinking about it in terms of economics, actually. Um, and the thing which is kind of exciting is that you get to, because you have the same underlying formalism, you get to import some of the discoveries of physics into these areas and get intuition from that. I'll just mention one other thing about, about computation. Um, so... Uh, one of the things that we're talking about is this sort of this idea of multiway systems. And I mentioned multiway Turing machines, and there's a whole sort of theory of multiway Turing machines. And what the, 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 the thing is that you can normally, when we think about computation, we think about computation where you have something where you give an input, you compute, you get an output. But in these multiway systems, it doesn't work that way. Instead, there's this whole kind of uh, collection of different behaviors that are occurring. And the question is, can one think about that when we're try if we're trying to, to uh, understand computation and how it works in, for example, systems in nature, is that relevant? And I, I have a suspicion that it will turn out that a core thing that you need to understand to understand biology is this phenomenon of multiway computation. 
that the model that we have that sort of a definite input produces a definite output, people try to sort of decompose biological systems that way, but it doesn't really work that well. And my guess is that, that we will need to understand the sort of phenomenon of multi-way computation to, to understand how that works in biological systems. I think also that um, uh, that kind of, um, uh, the, 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 if we want to make kind of molecular scale computation, one of the ways to do that is to use chemical processes. And in a sense, these pictures of multi-way Turing machines, they remind us for good reason of chemical reaction networks. Because in a sense, what's happening when typically in, in, in synthetic chemistry, um, you are interested in, fi in, in finding a particular path through the sequence of chemical reactions that produces a particular product. But the thing is to think about sort of the set of all possible paths and to try to understand what is, the, what is the sort of computation that can be done by following that set of all possible paths? Well, there's, uh, I mean, looping back a little bit um, to, uh, uh, to John Conway, I think um, um, one of the, um, uh, as I say, John Conway and I shared this interest in what do simple programs actually do what can simple programs do? And um, uh, some of the questions, uh, for example, um, I might uh, just mention something that I uh, um, discovered recently that is very Conway-esque. Um, so I was interested in the 3M plus one problem. Um, I was interested in that for a reason I can explain, but, but um, uh, there's sort of a question of, um, uh, and, and John Conway was, was interested in the 3M plus one problem. Um, and the question was sort of, what is the computational essence of the 3M plus one problem? How computationally sophisticated is it? When can it be a universal computer and so on? And so, uh, well, the, um, uh, this is kind of a story of, of the generalized 3M plus one problem and its relationship to known problems in mathematics and so on. And this is kind of a, a, I just discovered this a few weeks ago. This is kind of a new generalization of the 3M plus one problem that um, uh, kind of has, uh, is, has a bit more, I think, of a hope of being able to be, to being a very simple version of the 3M plus one problem that's capable of being proved to be computation universal. I, I might mention this is a, a um, something that um, is a very Conway-esque kind of study I don't know whether John actually studied tag systems ever, but he had systems very much like this. This is a system that was invented by a person called Emil Post about 100 years ago, where you just have a sequence of symbols, and at every step you chop off the first three symbols, and then depending on whether the first symbol was a zero or one, you either append zero, zero, or one, one, zero, one. Emil Post sort of was very proud of the fact that he'd reduced sort of the, the structure of Principia Mathematica, the structure of Russell and Whitehead's work on, on foundations of mathematics to being just a story of string rewriting. And he thought if he could only solve the problem of string rewriting, he would have solved all of mathematics. But he got stuck on this particular example. And uh, we've done a big analysis of this example. And the big question is, does it always halt or not? Does it, is it something where you can, you can always find, you know, in this case, it halts after 400 steps you can see kind of the behavior it produces. Um, and uh, these, are, these are kind of state transition graphs for it. Um, you, can, um, you can ask, does it always halt? Here it's halting after 25,000 steps. Here it's halting after a quarter million steps. And we've found now examples where I think the, the record breaker now is 12.7 trillion steps. So, uh, but what's interesting about this, and it's kind of a challenge for the principle of computational equivalence is, is it always going to halt? The prediction from the principle of computational equivalence will be, it will not always halt. Eventually we will find an initial condition which suddenly escapes to infinity. And what's strange about this is these patterns of, this is the size of the, of the string as a function of a number of steps. These patterns are, precisely follow random walks, so far as we can tell. They are indistinguishable from random walks. They have all the same sort of statistical properties as random walks, yet they are produced by a completely deterministic system. And the question is, is this system somehow, uh, is the system uh, one that is always going to halt, or is it that we can eventually find an initial condition that doesn't halt? In a sense, what we're doing here, this is a big glider gun search. 
in the game of life, for example, and this relates to John's original idea of, you know, use the game of life as a way of, of enumerating the recursive functions, the, the game of life in a first approximation is something where it always halts. The simple configurations always halt. But then Bill Gosper found this glider gun, which is the first configuration that doesn't always halt, that, that uh, grows forever. And so, so now we have another example here with these tag systems of a much more challenging case of, which is again, a sort of a challenge to this principle of computational equivalence. Is it going to always halt or not? I think not, but we're at 12.7 trillion steps so far and we haven't found an example yet. Uh, it's sort of interesting to ask the question, how would we even imagine proving that there wasn't such an example? Would we be able to prove it using piano arithmetic? Would we be able to prove it using mathematical induction? Will we need transfinite induction, set theory, to be able to prove it? How does this all fit together with, with these kind of different approaches and so on? And uh, I think this would be, uh, um, if if John Conway was still alive and, and uh, uh, we were in, in, in good communication, I think it would be an interesting conversation uh, given um, his interests in um, uh, his sort of uh, uh, efforts in being a professor of logic to, to ask this question about sort of what is the relationship between um, kind of these proof systems, these logical systems, and what can be reached with these very simple programs. Well, I'm, I'm not sure whether this was the, the kind of direction that you guys are interested in. I'm very happy to, to chat about um, uh, whatever whatever kinds of things you're interested in, but that was a, a quick survey of some of the kind of um, thinking about simple programs and, and places where things that I've been interested in uh, intersected with, um, uh, with things John Conway was interested in. Um, I, I haven't talked at all about um, uh, kind of how we, uh, how we harness the sort of power of the computational universe and the whole story of computational language and uh, uh, our efforts to build Waltham language and, and so on. And um, uh, John Conway was a longtime user of, of Mathematica and Waltham language. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, although I don't think I ever saw any code he wrote. Um, and I think um, uh, the, um, maybe he got other people to write the code. I'm not sure. It's always a, an interesting thing because a, a lot of, you know, kind of leaders of, of, of science, uh, most, many of them, most of them, um, use use our technology. And every so often I get to see a piece of code written by one of these people. And somehow it's an interesting for me because I understand this language well, it's like seeing the style of somebody's writing in English or something To And it, it gives one a sort of a, a, an understanding of a personality that is a little different than, than, than what one might get by other means. All right, I'm gonna, gonna stop there. And I'm very happy to, to take questions, comments, uh, thoughts, suggestions, whatever. Well, Kamalika, uh, am, am I allowed to uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. ask uh, one okay. question? Because I will have to leave. Sorry. Um, uh, it was an excellent and very interesting uh, lecture. And for me, uh, almost new. Almost 90% of the whole thing is, is, is uh, new to me. I am basically doing mathematics and logic. Uh, uh, my my question. I mean, there are many questions, but I, I will ask just one. You commented. Uh, you made a kind of uh, similarity between mathematics and physics. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to me, it seems uh, my understanding is this: that mathematics, uh, as it stands now, doesn't have any goal that way. Uh, on the other hand, physics, or so to say, any natural sciences have got some kind of goal, goal in the sense that there is some universe outside us and uh, we have to understand that universe or model that universe in some way or other. Uh, so that is a kind of goal as I understand about physics. I, I maybe physicists will, may disagree, but I am sure about mathematics that mathematics doesn't have any goal uh, because it, 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 it is not to discover anything it doesn't have any target. Also, it is spreading. Uh, as you said, I mean, your model was very nice to me, acceptable, a model for mathematical development. So my question is precisely this, that how or do you agree with this uh, view? If, uh, because as, as it seems that you don't agree with this view, 
I think it's a very interesting question, okay? This is a very interesting question. Um, let me show you something that perhaps is, is responsive to that question a little bit. So I was curious about Euclid. And Euclid has some, um, uh, you know, starts off with, you know, Euclid has a definite model of how mathematics progresses. Starts with, you know, 10 axioms, basically improves 460 theorems. And so you can kind of ask, what is the metamathematics? What is the empirical metamathematics of Euclid? That's a, that's a sort of chart that shows, given, you know, where you were in the book of Euc books of Euclid, what theorems were used in the proof of a given theorem. And you can kind of make these whole graphs. This is the metamathematical structure of Euclid. And so you can ask the question, there are many possible theorems that could have been proved given those axioms. This is the network of theorems that Euclid chose to pick out of the, of the space of all possible theorems. So what I see this as being is the kind of human geography of metamathematical space. There is an ultimate metamathematical space of all possible theorems that can be proved from those axioms. And this is the kind of human geography of what theorems humans chose to prove from that, uh, from that underlying structure. So, so the question you could ask is, well, there is this metamathematical space given, even if you imagine that mathematics starts from particular axiom systems, which I'm not sure is the right model of mathematics, but let's assume you start from that. Given those axioms, you can build out all possible theorems. And then you can ask the question. So you say, what's the goal of mathematics? Well, the goal of mathematics might be to, uh, you know, it, it's like, what's the goal of space exploration or something? It's like, go to places that are worth going to, that we humans think are worth going to. So I think it's a really interesting question. What, you know, to set the goals of mathematics have to do with where in metamathematical space do we humans want to go? The, the, so there's, a, there's two, two levels of that question. There's what does metamathematical space intrinsically look like? what is intrinsically out there in the space of possible theorems, and which theorems do we think are interesting enough to, to explore? And, and you can look, needless to say, in Euclid, you know, I can, you can generate branchial graphs and the whole story of, of physics-like stuff. Um, but, uh, oh, I can, I can show you here just for, for interest, sort of the analogy between metamathematics and, um, uh, and physics is a little bit clearer when you look at formal, uh, uh, formalizations of um, of mathematics. Uh, this is this is one. Let's see what is this. This is Pythagoras' theorem in um, a formal in in a, a, a formal proof assistant system. And this is looking essentially what's happening is at the very lowest level. It's like my atoms of space and so on. The very lowest level, you're dealing with these very microscopic kind of you know order relations and all kinds of all kinds of very low level mathematical things but then you build up to something which is more human interesting like pythagoras's theorem it takes about 10,000 of these microscopic sort of mathematical steps to build up to pythagoras's theorem so i think it's an interesting question what is the mathematics that we choose to study i mean in in um uh I, I've been sort of changing my mind a little bit actually very recently about kind of how this all fits together. Um, and what I think is the case, okay, my speculation, which may be incorrect, is the, the, a big story of mathematics is that there is ultimately this kind of ruleal universe, as I'm calling it, of kind of the consequences of all possible formal rules. It's that structure I was showing for Turing machines, you can build the same kind of thing for other kinds of rules. And then what we're doing is we're sampling that with various reference frames. What does that mean in mathematics? What that means is we've got some underlying thing in mathematics and we are using different description languages to describe pieces of that thing. So it might be that those description languages are like algebra. It might be those description languages are like geometry. What this suggests is that there is a fundamental equivalence between the things we're getting with those different description languages. And that fundamental equivalence is similar to relativistic invariance in physics. That in other words, there are these different reference frames for sampling this sort of underlying, you know, ultimate metamathematics. And we get to make different samples of that. And if there is equivalence between those things, what is the analog of relativity in mathematics? Is it, for example, something related to category theory or something like that, that describes a structure independent of the description language? And I don't know the answer to this, but that's, a, that's kind of my, my current level of thinking about what is the, 
you know, what's the analog? And, and you say, what's the goal of mathematics? I think that's a, a terrific question. I think, you know, we know what has been achieved in human mathematics. There are a few million theorems that are exist in the published literature of mathematics. And you can ask, what is the, what do we know from the sort of human geography of those theorems? And that's what things like these pictures of, you know, the metamathematics of the, the empirical metamathematics of Euclid try and, try and, try and talk about. But I, I'd love to know what is the limit you know, mathematics, consider mathematics and look at its limit, you know, an infinite number of years from now, what will mathematicians have done? And you might say, what mathematicians have done will be pure historical accident. In other words, people might have studied this area just because somebody thought it was important and so they went off and studied it. Or that's theory, theory number one about mathematics. It's all historical accident. Theory number two is there's something intrinsic about what's there in the structure of mathematics. And I'm increasingly suspecting that there's something intrinsically there. That there's an intrinsic structure to metamathematics and that there are strong constraints. You know, we can explore it with different essentially reference frames in different directions, but there will be commonalities between these different fields that will reflect the fundamental structure of mathematical space. Now, I don't, I don't know. This is a, you know, look, this is a this is an active project for me. I'm I'm sort of trying to make this kind of bulk limiting theory of metamathematics. Um, and then in answer to your question, what's the, you know, what does mathematics have as its goal? I might say it is the exploration of the mathematical universe, which is this, this kind of um, ultimate metamathematical space, that essentially what we're doing as we prove theorems in particular areas, we are, or we develop a particular area, we're developing a certain reference frame in which we then explore what is this ultimate kind of metamathematical space. I don't know if that's, I, I think most mathematicians today would not say that was the objective of mathematics. Um, but, uh, you know, that, if you look at the history of mathematics, okay, a hundred, you know, with people like Hilbert, there was sort of this idea mathematics is really going to be the exploration of arbitrary axiom systems. And that idea, has had some degree of success, but it's not what most practicing mathematicians would say they're doing in mathematics. And so this is sort of an alternative approach to thinking about what you're fundamentally doing in mathematics. I mean, I might say on the subject of axiom systems, uh, one of the things that I found interesting, uh, I mean, I've been interested in what, uh, where, do I have, where do I have this? I've been interested in kind of what the, um, uh, let's see here. Um, um, oops, yeah. What the kind of space of all possible axiom systems looks like. And so I was, was here interested in, um, this is, uh, so if I say, consider all these different possible axiom systems, what, uh, these, are, these are different possible axiom systems. Actually, let me show a different picture here. Uh, here's one. So this is saying, Given different axiom systems, what theorems are true in those axiom systems? So we're asking, this is kind of ultimate desiccated mathematics. These are possible axiom systems. These are possible theorems. A field of mathematics is characterized by where there are black dots, which theorems are true given those axioms. And so one thing I was interested in for a while is how did mathematics pick its axiom systems? Is there something special about at a sort of metamathematical level about the axiom systems that got picked that seemed to be about something as opposed to just being abstract axiom systems? And, and I couldn't figure that out. Um, what I did figure out was if you look at these axiom systems, where in the space of all possible axiom systems that the axiom systems that we actually use end up being. And my biggest achievement there was doing that for Boolean algebra. Let me show you an example there. Um, oh, let me see, I have to find it for a second here. Um, uh, there we go. Um, so, so I was interested in, if you just look at all possible axiom systems, where is Boolean algebra? How far out is Boolean algebra? And the answer is, it's about the 50,000th axiom system you get to, and, and this is it. This is the simplest axiom system for Boolean algebra. And um, there are several things that are interesting about that. First, where are the axiom systems that we've chosen to study? How far out are they? Second of all, a thing that I was particularly interested in here is the proof that that is a correct axiom system for Boolean algebra. I found by automated theorem proving, the proof is absolutely incomprehensible. And one of the questions that's interesting to me is, 
what is uh, the level of sort of asking what is mathematics a lot of what people are interested in, in mathematics is is kind of giving proofs that explain why things are true but this is a case where we have a proof that explains nothing it is pure machine code effectively um and uh, uh so i i was interested in in um in kind of uh how do you that this is a representation of the proof um and, and the lemma structure of the proof and the question is can you um uh you know what can you do how do you make that proof explainable how do you think about what mathematics is if, if mathematics is based on proofs and proofs are a way of explaining things to people how do you get to the point where proofs can be explained to people and what you realize is that there's this kind of uh, uh, this is kind of uh, it's impossible almost. <laughs> What's that? It is almost impossible to explain to people uh, uh, a mathematical proof in general. Well, right. I mean, so so these automated theorem proofs, the 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 way I think about it is, mm -hmm. if we knew that there was a lemma here that was really really popular, we would give it a name. And then people would gradually get used to that lemma. They'd be able to think in terms of that lemma. I mean, this is basically, it's the same story as with natural language. You know, when we, when we talk about things, if we didn't have a name for a, a chair or something, we would have a hard time reasoning about chairs. And the reason we have a name for a chair is because chairs are common. And I think it's the same thing with mathematical theorems and, and mathematics, that if something becomes common, you know, we humans give it a name and we can reason in terms of it. The, the difficulty with the, the question really is, as you start proving theorems, what, you know, how diverse are the, are the intermediate lemmas that you produce? And, and there's a lot that you can say about, you know, we, can, we could talk about, about sort of the, 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 the talk about when, what are, the, what are the best lemmas to use, so to speak, to, to get the furthest in doing mathematics and so on. But yeah, look, I think this problem of how do you, how do you make a proof explainable in, in, um, in part of my day job of building Wolfram Alpha, one of the things that's kind of fun there is we, we get to, to explain things because in Wolfram Alpha, you know, if, if you go and, um, you know, if you type in, I don't know, uh, you know, some, some random integral, let's see, some integral that, that um, uh, I don't know, what can we do? Log log cubed x or something. We'll get some answer for this integral, but then we say, show me the step-by-step -step solution. That's essentially showing for humans what, oh, this was too easy. I, I gave a really easy example here, but, but usually there'd be many steps here. And this is something where the computer is synthesizing a kind of human explainable uh, uh, proof of a, um, uh, of a result. So, but, but look, I really like your question of, of what's, what is, do you think you have a, a further answer to this question of, I mean, of what is mathematics I, trying me, to I, achieve? I do have uh, answers, but uh, sorry, I, I, if, you, if you allow me, I will um, have correspondences with you on this issue because there uh, must be many questions waiting for you now. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll be in touch with you, okay. Great. On this okay. No, it's a very interesting. Thank, Thank, you very Thank you very much. Okay. Kamalika, I am leaving. Kamalika. Okay, sir. Okay. Sir. Ah, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Stephen, can I ask a question about uh, ah. your shell patterns? About about what, sorry? Shell patterns. Yes, sure. Yeah. Uh, have you looked at the inverse problem? In other words, given a pattern, can you deduce the roots? Right. I mean, there are, there's a simple level at which you can do that. I haven't done it in a, in, in a serious way, as I should mean. In a sense, what I see... Um, uh, oops, maybe we should... Um, let's see. I, I did it for them, sorry. Um, the, uh, but, but okay, so in a sense, the effort of, of studying you know, simple programs and what they do is kind of like the forward problem. It's like the calculus yeah. problem. The inverse problem is kind of like the statistics problem. You know, how do you find the parameters that, that uh, uh, match something? Now, the interesting new game in town there is machine learning. 
because basically what machine learning is doing is it's taking the programs that correspond to neural networks and it's showing us that by bashing those things really hard with training, we can deduce kind of uh, uh, what the parameters of the neural network should be. And actually people have done a bunch of work recently on, on connecting neural networks to cellular automata. And in fact, there is a bunch of work now that's been done on precisely biological pigmentation patterns um, using, uh, using a combination of neural networks and cellular automata to try and use the neural net to basically uh, use training of neural nets as a way to effectively deduce the rule. Um, but it's, it's uh, to me, we don't have a very satisfactory way to think about that yet, because un in neural nets, the, the sort of the, the trick in neural nets is to use calculus, to use incremental improvement of these parameters. We don't have a way to do incremental improvement of things like cellular automata. But you know, the space of cellular automata is like, like it's, it's, a, it's a long way from one rule to the next. We, we don't know what the structure of that space is well enough to do incremental improvement. In the case of mollusk shells, I have looked at this in a bit more detail. There is a, a, a difficult geometrical problem of unrolling the, the mollusk because the mollusk made itself in a spiral. And uh, we've done some work on uh, using uh, image processing in, in Wolfram language to unroll the spirals of, of mollusk shells. Um, but that was never really finished. And once you've unrolled the spiral, then you can start asking, you know, can you put the thing on a grid and how do you, how do you align the thing and so on? Um, it's, uh, I would say I don't have adequate, uh, you know, I think that's a, an inadequately answered question at this point. I mean, I think that's a, the, the inverse problem of, uh, it's, it's kind of the generalized statistics problem because statistics, you say, you know, I've got this distribution of, 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 of results you know, do they fit more or less a Gaussian? Can I put these couple of parameters into the Gaussian to fit them? And what you're doing in the case of these simple programs is can I fit a program to this data? Neural nets are part of the way there. Neural nets are, can I, can I fit this continuously parameterized uh, function to this data? What we need to do for simple programs is can we find a, a way to do sort of fitting of simple programs to data? Um, and there are, you know, this is a very interesting topic. I, I think some of the things that we're doing in, the, in actually the, the sort of spin-offs from the physics project may give us some, some further hints about that, because in a sense, the story of these different possible rules is partly a story of this branchial space in multi-way systems and so on. But I, I, don't, I don't have good things to say about this yet. Um, uh, hopefully we will. Okay, it's part of, I, I gave a course uh, on reverse engineering the embryo. And uh -huh. This is a, a small problem in the general problem of doing that. <laughs> oh yeah, right, no, I mean, I say, the only thing I might comment about embryos, okay, is that we realized recently that our models of physics are also pretty interesting models of biological growth. And the reason for that is that because we have dynamic structure of space, it's like when you have cell divisions and so on, and normally you know, you're doing finite element analysis or something, it's a, it's a big pain to have the, the underlying geometry of the space change. But in our models of, 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 of physics, that isn't a problem. And in fact, we've realized, so we, we've already done uh, solving the Einstein equations using our, uh, as a piece of numerical relativity, doing that using, using our models. And we were about to embark on solving uh, uh, continuum mechanics equations using the same approach. And what's interesting about it is you can solve the continuum mechanics equations, including uh, cell division. So you can have something where, where there's mechanical stresses and there's cell division. And that might be interesting for embryology. Um, I mean, in other words, it's a, it gives you a way to, you know, to, to, I don't know how you do that right now, but, but I know people have done lots of sort of finite element methods, but it's very painful because, because the geometry of the underlying space is changing and you have to add all kinds of, of weird pieces to the, to the uh, finite element method to, to be able to deal with yeah. that. Yes, there, there's a component there which you don't see in the cellular automata very much. And that is that uh, there are continuous interactions between global and local phenomena in embryogenesis. Yes. Well, right, but I think you see part of the reason for that is because of this geometry thing. I mean, when you have, I don't know, something like gastrulation or something like that, you're going to see a, yeah. you know, dramatic kind of, um, uh, but, but that, that globality 
see, see, one thing that's interesting, I don't understand it for embryology at all, but it will be interesting to try to understand this. In, in physics, our models of these hypergraphs are completely local to the hypergraph, yet we see global phenomena like black holes, event horizons, all those kinds of things. And it's interesting that from the local, you get the global by virtue of the fact that the local is producing geometry and topology, which has certain, which has sort of a global aspect to it. And, and actually, now that I think about it, I bet the same thing would happen in embry embryology. And the question, I mean, I never understood. Uh, I, I, I remember Rene Tom was 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 always fond of talking about, you know, uh, algebraic topology and its relationship to to embryogenesis. And uh, I I don't know, maybe I I always felt that that the audience for his book, I, I thought I should be at least the one data point of people who understand a little bit about biological <laughs> growth, a little bit about algebraic topology. And I think I, I wound up being the zero data point because I never really understood it. But I kind of wonder whether there are relationships that one could draw, which I had not thought about, between the kinds of, of uh, growth processes and, and the way in which globality arises uh, similar to the way that sort of globality arises in physics. I don't know. I, I mean, I, the, the, the question is, is the, is the mechanics of globality purely a consequence of geometry, or do you imagine that they're little, you know, microtubule, you know, fibers or something that actually pull from one thing to another, or is it just because of the geometry? Well, I'm, I'm not sure if I can put it in, in your context, but uh, I've been working on this problem a long time and come to the conclusion that embryogenesis is, is basically what I call Janus-faced logic in that the cell responds to a global phenomenon and the global phenomena are set up by the cells. And uh, this occurs in a branching process. And so you get, you, it, it happens over and over again until you get the adult. So, I mean, one question there is, you know, in, in sort of the reaction diffusion approach where you have some sort of lo long range interaction from some morphogen, that's, that's one way you could imagine something more global happening, although that's still somewhat local. I mean, in, well, in yeah, yeah, I, I, I've published uh, in a book on Turing on uh, the inadequacy of the theory. It, it, it's great for one step of differentiation of cells, but it doesn't work for multiple steps. Well, that's interesting. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I would say that that I just as a as a you know, we haven't you know we just started looking at continuum mechanics and whether we can use the same mathematical structure for continuum mechanics we thought about embryogenesis because we thought that's a case where you have this change of geometry okay. and change of topology and i i you know if you've got students who think about these kinds of things you should you should get them to look at this because i think there might be something really wonderful okay there. look I, I read your whole book a number of years ago you might want to read you might want to read mine how do you get this in? Yeah, so there it is. Jim, uh, <laughs> oh, sir, wants, to, wants to ask questions. Okay, I'll, I'll copy that out and and um, we'll 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 um I, I recommend though that the um uh if you're let me let me show you one thing here. Um hold on, I have to store this. Um I'll show you one thing that might be of interest. Uh and then we'll We'll move on to something else, but but let me um, um okay. This might not at first seem relevant, but it, I think it is relevant. Um, so this is recent paper about. I don't know why this network is going so slowly. Um, this is a recent paper about solving the Einstein equations. Um, using our models. And um, uh, the, the, the idea here, this is, um, this is basically saying we can model the structure of space-time. Well, so, so th th this is looking at black hole mergers and things like that in our models. And the thing that I think is most relevant is that essentially what's happening is we're just solving a PDE here. You can think of it as solving a PDE, but it's solving a PDE where we actually get to represent. Let me show you something. I think this is an example someplace here. Uh, yeah, here we go. This is, um, what's this? 
I didn't write this paper, so I'm 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 allowed to not know how to find my way in it. Um, <laughs> okay. The, uh, it's um, okay. Um, okay, so this is a, a picture of a rapidly rotating black hole, modeled with our uh, with our kind of um, methodology. And the thing that's interesting is, in standard Einstein equations, if you solve this in numerical relativity, the code will get confused. Because what actually happens is a piece of the universe breaks off, and you can't represent that in standard PDE, in the, in the sort of standard right. continuum PDE model. But you can in these models that have uh, sort of this discrete structure of space time. So I, I think, um, mm -hmm. and I, again, I, I, I think there's something interesting here. I, I, I may be wrong, but I, I, I think there's something really interesting for biology in, in analyzing this, um, uh, this kind of. Um, uh, this kind of um, uh, relationship between, um, um, and, and I don't know the differentiation process. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how that so much relates, and um, you know, Hox genes and all that kind of thing. I'm not sure how that so how much that relates. But the thing that I do think we understand something about is mechanical stresses and geometry and the result of growth on geometry. Um, anyway, uh, interesting topic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, what we've done is link that to cell differentiation. You mean you mean you're you're asking a question? When does the cell differentiate based on its mechanical uh, situation? That's right. That's right. There are me mechanical waves which cross embryos, which seem to trigger the cells to change types. Interesting. Probably has a lot of medical implications. If that's if oh that's yes, <laughs> oh yes, but uh... yeah, very interesting. Okay, well I will look at this. Okay. The, um, okay, another. Professor Jam. Professor Ramanujan had a couple of questions. Yeah, well, uh, I, one question is uh, related to the point that you were talking about just before angiogenesis, which is about neural networks and the fact that they use continuous dynamics. And uh, isn't it that at the heart of all the learning that we see with neural nets today? And, uh, you know, while I've seen, uh, um, you know, all your explanations of physics, which are all descriptive in some sense, whereas uh, but for systems with goals like artificial intelligence and the use of neural nets and machine learning for these, uh, do you see similar uh, possibilities for the cellular automata based work, you know, the kind of dynamics that you have been doing? I mean, is there a combination of what seem to be two different ways in these. Uh, right, well, so, so one of the things to realize is people always say, um, let me put in, you know, I've got a cellular automaton, but I really want a cellular automaton whose rules can change. That's a very, very common thing for people to ask. Um, the, uh, um, so, um, the, um, uh, the, the thing that, um, to, to realize is, as soon as you have a universal system, that isn't a question you really need to ask, because a universal system has the feature that, you know, it can encode any rules it wants. So to say, oh, I've got another level where I'm putting in rules is not really the right thing. So the question is, then in these systems, do they, you know, do to what extent do the dynamics explore these the equivalent of different rules that have been inserted. And, you know, I, I think, um, what can I say about that? Uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the problem today of machine learning, I mean, that, you know, the, the, the most standard problem is um, how can you give a sort of global description of what's going in, on inside the neural net? I mean, if I, you know, if I just generate, um, let me see, oh, I had saved up here some, some game of life pictures. All right, sorry, I didn't show these. Um, these were just uh, uh, these are part of my my effort to understand um, uh, kind of um, uh, the sort of global meta engineering. Um, but but okay, let, let's just um, um, let's just ask about uh, uh, you know standard neural nets. I mean, if we say if I say something like um, you know, let's pick up. A, picture here let's pick up a picture of me and from the chat here and then let's um uh 
Okay, there we go. And now we could say something like image identify and picture. And if we're lucky, it's gonna say it's a human. Um, but if we, if we now were to say something like, um, okay, great, it said it's a person, that's a good sign. Um, so let's say I, I take this actual neural net. This is going to be the image identification network. Um, here, and I could open it up and I could look at all its details as a trained neural net. And now I could take that same picture here and I could say, um, let, me, let me look not at the final result, but let me look at the result of just, let's say, five layers of the neural net. So I go in here, I say five levels of the neural net. I'll get out some, I need to, need to make it into images. And so the question is, what was the neural net thinking? Um, Please mute. Uh, um, anyway, what, what the the um the question here is sort of what was the neural net thinking when it uh, generated these 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 forms, and that question is. I mean, that's similar to this question about automated theorem proving. How do we find a human understandable way of, of, of representing what's going on here? I, I would say that the, you know, to me, that's the, the, the well, okay. So, so one question is, can we use, for example, ideas from this physics project to analyze things in machine learning? The answer is we think there may be a way of doing that. We think that Normally in machine learning, you know, if I if I do a training, right? If I say net train, um, okay, sir, please mute. The, um, let me see. I can probably mute that. Uh, who is the host has to do this. Yeah, the host has to do it. So I'm going to assume that since I know who some of these people are. Um, this is very odd because I'm not I'm not seeing um uh, oh there we go. Mute. Okay, I got it. The um okay. In any case, the um uh, uh, what was I going to say? So, so when we do training, um, let's see, is this, uh, yeah. So this is, you know, a very trivial neural net, right? Um, if we say, let's say we want to train that network um, and let's say we bring in, hmm. You know, we have some standard training set. We say, um, uh, let's say, random sample. Say, you know, five hundred pieces of that um, uh, that training set. Okay, so what we're going to do here? Okay, there's our training set, and now we say train that model with that training set. So this is sort of the standard neural network thing that we would do. But notice that what we're doing is we're just dealing with a single instance with, with certain, we're, we're, there's all kinds of randomness involved in doing this training. But the point is we're looking at a, a single path of doing this training, okay? So the crazy thing that we can consider doing is to look at the multi-way graph of all possible training paths. Now that's something that as a practical matter, maybe quite hard, you know, it's very hard to do because that training that I just did there probably involved, I don't know, um, you know, that, that would be a giant multi-way graph with, you know, 10 to the 20th nodes or something. But nevertheless, um, oops, that's, what did I just do here? Oh, I didn't, yeah, I see what I did. Um, anyway, the, the um, that, um, uh, but the question is, can we in fact analyze can we say something about machine learning by looking at these multi-way graphs of all possible training paths? I don't know the answer to that yet, but this is the this is the thing that we've been thinking about is, for example, when you look at nearby training paths, nobody has done that. Nobody has looked at essentially the quantum analog of, of, of neural net training, where you've built up this whole multi-way graph and you're looking at what do nearby training paths do? 
no idea. Um, and uh, whether that will tell one things about robustness of neural nets or or other kinds of things, I don't know. But that's that's the closest I can see uh, between between what. Um, but I think you were asking also about cellular automata and so on. One of the things about neural nets is that it probably isn't the case that all of the details of neural nets and the you know the sixteen bit you know floating point numbers and so on that probably is completely unnecessary for the operation of neural nets. Um, and the and the question is what um, um, uh, you know. What level of um, 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 uh, you know the the question is kind of what level of um, uh, there's sort of a trade-off between these things where the the model as you run it is very simple and efficient and the thing is readily trainable. We don't understand what that what that trade-off really looks like of you know what models are both. Uh, sort of structurally simple and easy to train, or does it, is it the case that ease of training is necessarily uh, sort of correlated with um, uh, with having a complicated model? So don't know how that works. Let's see. Any other? Uh... Something in the chat. Oh, okay, let me look at chat. Um, Okay. Professor General Juarez has some questions. Professor General, please. Oh, Gennaro, okay. Decide. Oh, maybe. Uh, so, uh, may I ask one question? Uh, okay, Jody, please. okay, Gennaro, ready. Gennaro, please. Well, let's see. Um, Gennaro? Hello. Okay. Hello. Can you decide, given a random plot, what Turing machine is working? Oh, I see. Okay, so so. Uh, yeah, you're not you're asking. Given some picture of the behavior of a Turing machine, can we guess whether that Turing machine is universal or not? No, that's a horrible, undecidable problem. I think as a as a okay, so as a sort of intuitive yeah. matter. I've gotten pretty good at guessing that. I don't think we have a systematic way to do that yet. Um, we've, we've done a bunch of experiments with machine learning and so on to try to identify uh, sort of different, uh, okay, so for example, with those tag systems, we've tried using machine learning to understand about the, the halting times of tag systems. So far, that was not very successful, um, but I, I, I think it is, you know, there's more that can be done there. I, 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 I don't think that's an exhausted kind of thing. I think machine learning is machine learning is pretty bad at identifying sort of deep computational processes. It's pretty good at identifying things that we thought were hard for computers, but are pretty easy for humans, and that in fact turn out to be fairly shallow computational processes like object identification and images and so on. You had another question about limit of the physics project with respect to universal constructors. Uh, gosh. Um, well, I, I don't know if we've ever talked about them, but I've been interested in universal constructors for a long time. Um, and I'm particularly interested in, in practical universal constructors made of molecules. Um, and sort of one of the goals I think is can we make, you know, given carbon atoms, can we produce a thing that will make an arbitrary structure out of carbon atoms? Um, and I'm kind of thinking that some of this multi-way computation stuff might be relevant to that, because that's essentially the, the, you know, what is the relationship between a universal constructor and universal synthetic chemistry? Chemistry is a story of trying to construct structures out of, um, uh, you know, by you make certain moves can you construct this particular structure? That's what synthetic chemistry is about. And so a universal constructor, in a sense, it's, it's like, uh, you know, can we mimic that kind of thing computationally? Maybe, I really have not, well, let's see, have I thought about this? It's an interesting question, whether with graphs we can do better at universal construction than we've been able to do with things like cellular automata. That is an interesting question. Um, the, uh, I think that um, um, it's a good question. Should look at that. 
I mean, a thing that I have done a little bit along these lines is I've been interested in universal robotics. So, you know, it's an easy observation about, about computing that, you know, computing really took off when there were general purpose computers. The question is, there isn't yet general purpose robotics. Is there a way that we can imagine making something that has a, a small number of sort of fundamental components and that can do general purpose mechanical tasks? And I've for years been interested in that question. And there was a, a person at our summer school this last year who made some progress in that question, mechanical engineer uh, um, from South Africa, who made some progress in that question of, of answering the question, can you have these, these simple component parts where by appropriate planning and programming, you can get them to, uh, to perform a variety of different uh, mechanical tasks. But actually, you, I, I'm, I'm um, uh, you guys are asking good questions today. This is fun. Um, this is, uh, uh, that's a good question. Whether, whether there is a better way to think about universal construction in the case of graphs than in the case of cellular automata. I mean, to confuse things, not to confuse things, there is this area of quantum mechanics called constructor theory that David Deutsch has been pushing. I think we recently understood, and I'm afraid it's not, not quite the same thing as universal constructors. It's about how do you construct things out of, out of quantum mechanical components. I think we understand how that works in our models, but that's, that's sort of a different question. Um, so. Yeah, Professor Shukamba, we have a question. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Stephen, for so many interest, I mean, interesting talk. So I have a couple of questions, actually. So uh, you were talking about uh, rule 110, 100 mm -hmm. and you are talking about the universal computation. But in all the cases, what you have considered, I mean, the, the lattice size is infinite, right? Lattice size is infinite. Yes, yes, that's correct. But, 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 but in the real case, if you want to do computation, so we, sh we have to consider the finite size, I mean, lattice size as finite. So some people are there like us, we do research and cellular automata considering, mainly considering the lattice size as finite. So what is the command? This relationship, this uh, cellular automata with final, what final lattice size and infinite lattice size. Can we uh, do universal computation on all, all the things you have shown in your, uh, in your talk and in your research? So can you achieve all these things or some of these things using finite cellular automata? Well, okay, so, so a Turing machine with a finite tape cannot be universal in the formal sense. There's a good question, which is what is the junior version of universal computation when you have a finite tape? What, is the, what does it look like? What can you do? It's like more computational complexity theory than computation theory. You're asking, given a finite size, what kinds of computations can you do? And we've studied that a bit for, for some kinds of systems. I've studied finite cellular automata quite a bit, um, studied finite Turing machines a fair amount now. Um, the, uh, I would say that we don't have a general theory. Okay, so, so this question of, of sort of how the finite to infinite limit works, we don't have a general theory of that. I mean, we can certainly look at, for example, state transition graphs, which are easy to produce in a finite case. And we can say, what is the limit of the state transition graph as you take the size to infinity? Not very well understood, really, really interesting area, not particularly well understood. Now, if you ask a question, um, so I'll show you an example of something um, that I was looking at recently. Uh, let's see if I can find this here. Um, uh, where is this now? Here we go. Um, so I was studying combinators. Combinators are a simple model of computation that was invented before Turing machines. It was invented December 7th, 1920. Um, these particular, these rewrite rules, combinators are very abstract things. Uh, I realized sort of after the fact that I've kind of used combinators in the design of Wolfram language and its predecessor for 40 years, but I haven't really internalized combinators. And uh, so, so combinators, you can think of them as being transformation rules for trees. And where do I have it here? Uh, so, so these combinators, this is the, uh, so the, the rule there was, again, a very simple rule, uh, you know, you can implement in Wolfram language, it's a, it's a trivial one-line program. Um, why isn't that getting bigger? Uh, there we go. Um, ag. Okay, so that, that's the rule. That's the rule for the S combinator. And you can think of that as a transformation rule for a tree. Okay. 
So now, this is um, uh, a question of the same kind of universal computation question. We can start asking, uh, what do combinations of these, what do these combinators do for different initial conditions? And this is a case where what we're essentially doing is growing trees, and this is showing the sizes of the trees. And there are really funky cases where that's that's showing tree size and so on. And combinators are a little bit more, there are, there are combinators where it's sort of interesting how, how quickly you get these bizarre pieces of number theory that show up. And this is a this is a very Conway-esque thing, but going back, back to John Conway, it's very that um uh that you get these just completely weird mathematical number theoretic constructs coming out of these um um uh these kind of simple programs. Um this is one that takes how many steps was this? This took um uh 36 million steps to halt. But what's my point here? My point is that I'm not sure if I can show a good example of this. These are these are just what these combinator trees are doing. Um, there's a question again of universal computation in the pure S combinator. And what's interesting about that is that, well, it, it like the, the rule 110 case, like the two three Turing machine case, this case can be a universal computer, but it must be operating on infinite configurations and infinite trees. Um, uh, it's um, I I don't consider it um, you know ultimately universal computation is a story of infinite things it's a limiting story of infinite things um, but okay so a good question here which I have not looked at is is there a finite size analog of combinators good question something to study I don't know combinators unlike instead of having a lattice combinators grow trees. So the question is, how do you constrain this tree to be a finite size, and then what would it do? I don't know. That's a that would be a good project for some. I'm I'm going to, um, I that's a, a good project for somebody at our summer school or something, um, to look at finite combinators. It's it's just something that hasn't been studied. I think you said you had another question as well, or another comment as well. Okay, thank you. Actually, uh, uh, okay, we have two more questions actually. So. Uh, uh, so uh, ECA, uh, even in infinite setting, it can do so many things. You know, it can model, it can uh, uh, so many things of nature uh, that we have studied. You have studied, and so many people have studied. But there are some problems, like firing squad problem, that cannot be solved by say uh, ECA. So do you think that to understand the nature or you know natural things or physical system, you know uh, ECA is sufficient? The elements left over they are sufficient or we should go beyond of that. Maybe uh, ECA with more states or uh, increasing dimension. What are the comments? Yeah, I mean, so the, the issue really is, there's sort of a trade-off. I think that the, the fact that 256 rules get as far as they do in modeling systems in nature is totally remarkable to me. I mean, it, it's it's bizarre. In fact, I'm, I'm, um, I'm standing in a room here that has a bunch of file cabinets and um, these file cabinets contain papers that I used to collect on on different uh, applications of cellular automata, and I, I, you know, I had a file folder for each rule, and you know, all of these different rules they've got in applications, you know, like Rule One Eighty Four, model for traffic flow, you know, Rule Ninety, model for catalysis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's bizarre that it's been possible to get so far with such simple rules. Can it get everywhere? Absolutely not. Not in a useful way. I mean, for example, our models of physics have nothing to do with elementary cellular automata. They're a different kind of model. Um, but I think the the thing that's always a trade-off is it's like, okay, it's like doing a pure mathematics versus applied mathematics. The elementary cellular automata are worth studying because they're the simplest case. It's like studying pure mathematics. It's like studying, you know, the general theory of, of simple algebraic equations even though the equations that may show up in some very practical situation may need to be 10 different equations, but it's still worth doing the pure mathematics of studying the individual simple equation. And as I say, it's remarkable how far the elementary cellular automata have been able to get in modeling practical things. It's, it's kind of, they've been more successful if you compare them with, for example, let's say cubic equations, okay? which, you know, cubic equations have been used to model a bunch of things. I suspect the elementary cellular automata, if you just count 
the number of phenomena that can be modeled, you probably they win relative to cubic equations, which is completely remarkable. Um, but no, it, it will not get you everything. It is a very useful piece of pure mathematics in some sense, pure computational universe science to, um, uh, uh, to do that. And um, I think, um, um, uh, you know, so, so that's, uh, but, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, and the thing that is just sort of really amazing to me is that, you know, I started studying elementary cellular automata 40 years ago. I am amazed that there are still things that I discover now about elementary cellular automata, which is just the craziest thing. There's so much depth there. Like I'll show you something uh, might be kind of fun here about elementary cellular automata that I'd never looked at. Uh, let's see where I can get to it. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Um, let's see, where is it? Um, here we go. So this is looking at, uh, this is looking at the Rulial space of elementary cellular automata. So it's looking at if you, uh, if you allow all possible rules, so it's kind of a non-deterministic cellular automaton, you allow all possible rules and you ask the question, um, um, starting from a single black cell, what configurations can you get to by following all possible rules? And um, it's just, you know, they're just structures I've never seen before. And it's kind of a different thing to look at in elementary cellular automata. And I didn't really finish looking at this. This is just a beginning of, of what one could do with this. But it's sort of remarkable that there's that much depth in these systems that still after 40 years, there's lots to study and lots of people doing interesting things on them. So I, I think even though they might not be the, the story of the particular way to model a particular thing, they're super interesting in terms of sort of the pure basic science of what's going on. Okay, I have another question for you. Thank you. Uh, sure. So, uh, uh, you know, some people, after you are working from the late 80s, some people started working on, say, non uniform cellular automata or hybrid cellular automata, where uh, the cells uh, of the lattice, I mean, the cells may follow different, you know, uh, different rules. Okay. And what we, have found, what we have found that most of the work on, on hybrid cellular automata or non uniform cellular automata, they consider your, I mean, the ECA rules. Okay, and additionally, what we have observed under finite setting, so they show some interesting property which the classical cellular automata, I mean the uniform cellular automata cannot. So my question is, uh, do you think that this kind of non-uniformity, introduction of non-uniformity, can handle the situations which you have just mentioned that all the situations, you know, uh, the ECA, the classical uh, the uniform ECA cannot. It seems like an interesting thing to study. You know, I remember I I looked at this years ago. Um, let me see if I can pull something up here. Um, uh, hold on a second. Um, actually, I'll, I'll give you two, two, two comments about this. Um, hold on one second. I have someplace here I should have a very, very old paper that I wrote. Um, the, let's see. I haven't looked at this in... Oh, probably 40 years, close to 35 years. Um, so this is, hopefully, there we go. Okay, so this was about uh, inhomogeneous in cellular automata. This was about cellular automata where, where there are combinations of, um, of different rules. And I, I don't know, uh, oh, I actually looked at this in the NKS book as well. Yeah, I looked at, at the case where, um, um, I mean, look, it's, it's a way of, of parametrizing, you know, for example, where you pick the initial condition to have to be something where you're picking both the initial value of a cell and which rule you use at that position, where, where you have a non-dynamic version of, uh, you know, where you have a kind of a spin glass, a frozen version of what rule is used at, at each cell. Um, I, no, I think that's a, a perfectly interesting thing to study. I, I would say that there's a, okay, I'll give you a, a very immediate use case. Um, for various reasons, I've been studying distributed consensus uh, for blockchains and so on. And there's a, a big trend in, um, uh, in using um, um, 
uh, cellular automaton models. So in particular, there's, oh, for example, there's a, a, um, uh, um, a blockchain called NKN, which needless to say sort of rhymes with NKS. Um, and NKN is, um, uh, um, okay, so this, this works using, um, uh, uh, using cellular automaton uh, distributed consensus. And it is all, I don't know whether they talk about it on this, on this page, but maybe they do, maybe they don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay, they, they may not talk about it here, but, but this, um, uh, um, this uses uh, a cellular automaton approach to consensus. Um, to achieving, and so I, I was starting to look at that actually, and, and there's even we're going to be doing a little conference with these guys um, uh, about um, uh, about using cellular automata. Um, and you mentioned the firing squad problem. Um, I haven't studied that particular problem very much, um, but um, uh, there's some um, uh, this consensus problem is kind of a, a, a junior version of that problem, and um, so I, I think. Uh, you know, these questions about inhomogeneous cellular automata may turn out to be quite interesting for uh, for distributed consensus. Um, although I'm also interested in asynchronous graph based models of um, of the of the sort of interactions that happen there. But that's a that's a place where these things might be applicable. The interesting yeah, stuff. Keep keep studying. If you've been studying, you know, elementary cellular automata, there's there's just so much to figure out about them, and um, it, it's they're just they're just amazing things. I, I I'm you know I'm I'm just uh, as I say I'm I'm continually surprised by by things where I I you know I I would have expected I could um, um, uh, would have known it years ago. Okay, let's see. We had a, a su supriti. Is that right or is that? Um, yes, or? yes, sir. Supriti. Uh, hello, sir. I have a question. Uh, so do you think by adding non-uniformity in a cellular automaton, it can lose any of its properties? It can lose its properties as a result of non-uniformity, yeah. as, in, as in some cells behave differently from others. Oh. You, mean, you mean if you, if you make um, uh, some cells different from other cells, is, is, that, is that what yeah. you mean? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, each cell right. may not uh, use the same rule. Sure. No, I mean that. That's that's absolutely. And and what you see there is so. So I mean, okay. The thing you have to understand is using different rules is really no different from having one rule and changing the states. You can't do it within elementary cellular automata, but with more complicated cellular automata, you could just say, let's imagine we have a, a two-bit state at each cell, right? And we use one of those bits as a control bit. And that control bit just says, which rule are we gonna use? It just picks between two rules. Then we can say, let's have a master rule, which is works with both of those rules but we're picking between the subcases of this master rule based on that control bit. So then we no longer have an inhomogeneous system. We now have a system which has a single rule, but we have slightly more complicated states, slightly more complicated rule. So a question that will be a good question to answer is, when can you decompose? When can you find initial conditions? So I, I looked at this in the NKS book, actually. Let me pull that up for a second. Um, let's see. So this question of, of when, um, okay, so it's partly a question of when can one cellular automaton uh, behave like another cellular automaton? Let's see where this is. Uh, where is it? Here we go. So this is the question of, of um, you know, this is, this is rule 54 and um, uh, the, Let's see, where's a good example? I think Gennaro has studied some of these things. So, so he may have better things to say than I do here. Um, the question is, okay, so one model would be that at every cell, you have you know, a four state cell and one of the bits in that cell is a control bit, okay? That's one way that you can make an inhomogeneous cellular automaton. Another way you could do it is to say, uh, we'll just, uh, the initial condition Will encode how uh, will will encode what's going on. So, for example, let me see if I've got an example here. 
Um, uh, let's see. Where do I have this? Well, this is, is this the right place. Maybe I have it here. Yeah, this is a this is a possible example. Okay, so this is, you could say I'll have I'll have a rule that is just rule ninety basically, um, and it'll make that pattern. I have another rule; it's rule fifty uh, rule forty five. It'll make that kind of pattern. But what we're learning here is this is just all these pictures are rule forty five. But by changing the initial conditions, we can effectively make rule forty five behave like rule ninety here. So there's this question of when can you, just by changing the initial conditions, make one rule behave like another one? And the answer is, I've worked out some networks of when one rule can behave like another, and it isn't the case that to get this sort of inhomogeneous behavior, you have to make a more complicated rule in which you can pick different rules at different cells. It can be the case that you can get that inhomogeneous behavior just by finding the right initial condition so that you can effectively, so the, the effective rule encodes this, this thing that has more bits. And, and that's, that's something very similar to what happens with the renormalization group in, in condensed matter physics. It's kind of this question of when you block things together, can you get a different rule encoded than when you're at sort of the lowest level of bits? So that's, I mean, I, th I think in terms of what one can look at with that, uh, I, I would say that this question of, of sort of, I've only looked at elementary cellular automata emulating elementary cellular automata. It would be a good question, when can an elementary cellular automaton, by changing its initial condition, emulate a four-state cellular automaton that has a control bit, basically? So that would be that would be what I would do to, to try and analyze that question about inhomogeneous versus homogeneous rules. Um, hopefully that's that's useful. The, uh, in, uh, in my PhD work, I have seen that any non-uniform CA can be simulated by uniform C by increasing the number of states per cell. But uh, there are absolutely. some uniform CA which cannot simulate any non-uniform C. So we are confused to declare uh, non uniform CAs are more powerful than non-uniform CAs. So wait a minute, you're saying there exist uniform cellular automata that cannot emulate any non-uniform cellular automata. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. But any non I find that a very be... difficult. I, okay, I'm going to I'm going to say something outrageous, which is I don't believe you could possibly have proved that. Okay, and here's why, because I think that if you allow blocks of, of, um, uh, of, to know that you cannot have a block of any length in the initial data that can lead to that is, a, is something, I think that will be undecidable, whether that's possible. That is, there will be no upper bound on this. If you don't have an upper bound on the size of blocks that you're using to encode every individual bit, um, the, the, I, I don't think you can know what an upper bound is on the size of block you might need to use to get an emulation. So for example, here, I don't know how big these blocks are, but the, let's see, how, how big are those blocks? I'm not sure, but these are, these are well, let, let's see, I have an example. Let, let, let me look for one example here, if I, if I remember where it is. Where is it? I think it's in here. Um, yes, here, okay. So, so this is looking at, okay, that's rule 150 emulating itself. Let's see if there's a more non-trivial case. Okay, so yeah, what the heck is this? This isn't the right one. Um, yeah, so th this is a block emulation, but the question is, uh, here we go, so we're talking about rule emulations. Okay, so this is a network of, which elementary cellular automata can emulate which elementary cellular automata with blocks up to length eight, okay? So I have no idea. If I allow blocks up to length 100, I have no idea what this picture would look like. And I claim you, you don't know, because I think it's an undecidable problem. Uh, for example, if you ask the question, can rule, some particular rule here, can rule 54 ever emulate Rule 110, 
with blocks of any size. I don't think that's a question that is readily answerable. I mean, if you if you find an emulation, then yes, you've got the answer. But to prove that it can't emulate, I think is very hard. So maybe I misunderstood what what I, I suspect your result will be something where you you require blocks of only a fixed size. I mean, by the way, that's a terrific topic. I mean, I'm glad you I'm glad you've studied it because it's a very interesting topic. And um, uh, but but um, the the you know I think there's this question of what, I mean, like, like extending this picture for larger block sizes will be interesting and trying to make, in fact, now that I think about it, I bet we could use automated theorem proving to try and establish, that's a good idea. You know, you guys are giving me more ideas than I, per, per unit time for, for, I think, by the way, some of you guys, you know that we do the summer school every year. Um, and this year we're doing it, uh, we're, we're doing it virtually. And if you're interested in questions like this, come to our summer school, because this will be, I mean, like, for example, figuring out this network and the generalization of this network, that would be, there's a, I, I haven't just had an idea about how to use automated theorem proving to do that. That would be a very interesting project. And, and it would give one, it would let one greatly extend kind of um, uh, the, um, the, the range of, of what, what one can understand about how one rule can emulate another. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I would encourage it. It sounds like there's a, there's a lot of cellular automaton enthusiasts here and our summer school is just a great place to, um, to study those things. And, and you know, as we bring in online these new methods like automated theorem proving, like some of these things that have come about from the physics project, um, it's, uh, you know, it, it I think provides new raw material for things to, to study with, with cellular automata. Um, looked like there were other hands up and maybe other questions. And um, uh, let's see, I, I, I can't um, can't get the, let's see, I need labels. Yeah, yeah, I'm asking you a question. <laughs> Please. Yeah, sir, actually there are a couple of uh, questions in the chat box also, but let me first ask you, ask you my question. So, uh, regarding what Shukriti was talking, what is your view that uh, whether uh, non-uniform CA can be less powerful than uniform CA in finite case we are talking about? So whatever she has studied, that is on finite. Ah, finite case. case. Yeah, on finite um, case, what, what do you think? Uniform CA will be more powerful than non-uniform CA or uh, the reverse one? Well, what do we mean by more powerful? I mean, in, uh, look, I really haven't um, looked at non-uniform cellular automata. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm. You're almost making me. I'm, I'm wondering whether I can use. Gosh, I think that the built-in cellular automaton function in Wolfram language is not going to do a good job. Well, let's see. Can we make a, a non-uniform CA quickly? Uh, well, here, here's a way to do it. Um, okay, so here's a question that I would have for you is the state transition graphs for non-uniform CAs, finite non-uniform CAs. I've never looked at those. Probably you guys have looked at those. Um, what can you say about the structures that arise there? Um, I would say is, um, um, okay, so, so let, let's do an example. Okay, so let's, um, let me see. So what I probably want to say is because I'm going to do non-uniform stuff. So I'm going to say, how will I do this? Um, offset D, okay. So we're going to have a function F. We're going to have some list here. Let's say random integer 120. Um, and let's say, oh, but we're going to have a horror with that. Hold on a second, we have to, I'm thinking how to do this. Um, uh, let's see, we have a, a partition of a list here, length three, and we want a cyclic partitioning of that list. And here I have to look at the documentation to remember how this works. Uh, let's see, with the original list, so, this would be um, trying to remember how to do this. Maybe somebody knows how to do this. There is a good um, uh, 
Oh, look, what I was hoping to do was just to compute. Uh, okay, so what I would do to answer this question, okay, is I would look at, oh, come on, I got to be able to do this. Can somebody help me here? I've, I've, somebody's going to know how to do this. Um, I'm just, I'm trying to remember how to get a, um, okay, let's just see if this works. Oh, come on. Okay, that's better. All right. I was just trying to get some cyclically permuting list. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to say, let me think how to do this. So for every cell, I'm going to have a pair of, of numbers. I'm going to say what rule it is and what value it has. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, so, so for example, here, I'm going to generate um, how to do this. Um, okay. So this is going to be the rule. And then for each of those, I'm going to generate the um, all possible tuples of ones and zeros. Let me do it for a smaller case here. Let me do it for size four, um, one zero size four. Now what I want to do is I want to say the outer list of this set of tuples. Oh, actually what I want to do here is I want to say, yeah, I think this is right. Um, oh, no, that's not right. Okay, hold on. Okay, here we go. So what this is representing is all possible rule application specifications and all possible initial conditions here. Okay, so let me, um, uh, sorry, let me just save this. Um, um, okay, all possible rules and rule applications. Okay, so for each of those then, what I'm gonna want to do is to say, so I'm going to say non-uniform cellular automaton, and I want to give it a pair of rules, rule one, rule, whoops, rule one, uh, rule one, rule two. And I'm going to then, uh, let's see, some list here. Let me just do this. And what I want to do is I want to say partition Ah, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I want to say control list and the states list. Okay, I want to partition that. And then what I want to do, let's think how to do this. One change I need to make here to line this up properly. We're going to get this. Let's see. That's the first one. Yes, that's right. Okay. Now, for this, what we want to do is we want to say cellular automaton of. The rule number, okay, so this actually, these are, let's just call this rules. 
automaton rules sub sub hash one. Uh, hold on, just think for a second here. Sorry. Um, let's see, just a second. Um, oh, I see. I see how I have to do this. Map indexed rules. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, takes me a moment here. Uh, this is more complicated than I expected. All right, let's see. That's the rule for the cellular automaton. And then I want to apply that rule to No, wait a second. Hold on one second. We're not quite there yet. Um, oh, I see. We want to apply that to this thing here. All right, let's see if this breaks horribly. Okay, so let's say rule 30 and rule 90, and let's say we pick as our case, something like this. Let's see whether this works. Um, okay, I think what we have to do now is say in that we have to say hash sub two Map over this. Okay, so whoops, what happened here? What's going on? That's that. Okay, we're almost there. So let me let me just, I'm not gonna give up now. Um, what did it do wrong? Hold on one second here. Um, what is on earth is happening? I am very confused. Let's try this again. What did I just change? Uh, oh, I goofed something up here. Hold on one second here. Um, so what I'm trying to do, let's just see what this is. Um, Okay, that looks good. Um, okay, so here, what is this doing? Um, I'm very confused by this. Okay, rotate right. Uh, 
Um, hold on one second. What is this doing? Let's see. Oh, oh, very, very silly. Very silly. Sorry about that. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, we got it. All right. Okay, so what this is doing is this is going to tell us for every initial condition, all right, it's going to give us the update based on those two cellular automaton rules. So now what we can do here is make a state transition graph. So here we've got these things. All right. This is, if we say this, we should get what we need here. Um, okay, so those are the states. And so for each state, we want to say hash goes to NUCA of 3060, 3090, let's say, um, of hash, map that onto this and make a graph of that. Okay, okay, that's kind of interesting. All right, so what this is, let me explain what this is. So now I've, I've got for these, so, so just to check, if we do this with 30, 30, 30, then, why are those making separate? Oh, that must be, yeah, okay. So these are, these are states of rule, this is just rule 30 on its own. This is saying at every cell, just use rule 30 to update things. So, so we can just, just to show what this is doing, this is saying, uh, here we go, let's remove this graph thing. Okay, this, so this is showing, oh, oh, oh. Oh, I see what I did wrong. Okay, hold on. We need to do something slightly different here. Um, sorry, I need to return a slightly different thing here to make this work right. Hold on one second. Um, This should work better. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now this one, here we go. Okay, so this is great. All right. So that is rule 30 on its own. That's showing, and there are many identical states here. So so it's it's kind of it's kind of it's got many copies. But what's happening here is we're saying it's an inhomogeneous cellular automaton. But the inhomogeneity is not really an inhomogeneity because every state works the same. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're saying, um, in this case, we're looking at two different rules, 30 and 90, and we're asking what does the state transition graph look like in, those in that case, okay? Okay, so now we can ask, um, now let's do the obvious thing and let, well, let's, for example, we can do this and we can try looking at it, um, size n here i don't know how big we can get it but let's just try one one size up let's say with n equals five uh okay so that's now the um the inhomogeneous cellular automaton it's kind of interesting actually um that you get from um from 30 and 90 let's see whether we can live dangerously let's try one more level up um and so this is going to give us these cycles. Now, if we did this for rule 30 on its own, okay, there we go. So that, that's the structure. And it, it's sort of interesting that there isn't, as, if we did this for rule 30 on its own, we'll get a lot of identical elements. Well, we could, we could just do this for pure rule 30. So we, we could just say um, tuples uh, 106. We could just say 
hash goes to cellular automaton. So this is an ordinary state transition graph for this cellular automaton. And we could just make, so this will be a size six ordinary state transition graph for rule 30. We go to much larger sizes here. We can go to like rule size 12 or something. Maybe we can go to size 12. Maybe we can't go to size 12. Oh, there we go. So one thing we see here is there are multiple identical copies of the same structure, right? Whereas here in this inhomogeneous case, it looks like we're not getting identical copies. And the reason for that must be that there's symmetry breaking. There's some group operation that we can do in this case that we can't do in this case. But let's look, uh, just for fun, let's look at what happens in um, uh, for all possible. Um, let's see, why don't we try um, the first, like, let's say the first 30. Should we try that? No, it's a bit too big already. Well, we could try that. Um, Okay, let's do this. Uh, let's just see. Um, let me just check something here. I hope this machine that I have here is set up to use, oh, oh no, boring, boring, boring. Oh, maybe it'll do better. Hold on, let's see what happens here. Ah, very good. This is gonna work in, in, okay. So I'm gonna use a bunch of parallel computers. I'm gonna use probably a hundred parallel machines to do this computation because otherwise it's gonna be too slow. Um, okay, let's let's make things. Okay, let's see. Starting up 156 uh, cores here. Um, let's uh, that'll make it a lot faster. Okay, so here goes. All right, fine. Did that. That wasn't very exciting. Okay, so now let's take this, and we're going to try for i j here. We are going to look at this for. We're going to make a, a parallel table. Um, we're going to label it with ij. Let's just do a small case to begin with. Let's say i up to five, j up to five. So this is now going to be all possible uh, taking a rather long time. I'm surprised. Um, this is this is oh, here we go. Here we go. It's, it's taking a while to, okay. So this is now the state transition diagrams for all possible inhomogeneous cellular automata on a size five lattice that use two different rules. Um, that's kind of, okay. So we see here when the two rules are the same, we see lots of symmetry. And when the rules are different, we're seeing a lot less symmetry. So that's kind of a first first observation. I don't know what else, um, but this is, this is, I mean, you, you this is how I would start to analyze these inhomogeneous cellular automata. Um, and I, I, I mean, it would, uh, and then. This is periodic boundary conditions that I was using here. I could have done something different, but that was what I, that was what I was messing around with that um, uh, partition with a cyclic partition thing. Yeah. So this is, this is still, um, uh, so I'm, I'm sort of assuming that what's going to happen here is that there's lots of group symmetries in these cases here, and that those symmetries get broken when they're inhomogeneous systems. And you could kind of un analyze, you know, one thing might be interesting to analyze is the way that that symmetry breaks down as you add inhomogeneity. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I've never looked at these before. So, uh, you know, this, this, this is cool. I, I'm, I'm, um, I mean, these are, these are very trivial. We, we could, um, Perhaps we could look at some favorite rules. I don't know. We could let, let's just look for fun at the case of um, uh, let's look at rules. Um, what are your favorite rules? Let's do 90, 18, 22, 30, 110, just for good measure. 73, that's always a good one. Okay, let's look at those. So those are pairs of rules. So then what we're going to do here is we're going to say. Uh, for those pairs of rules, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to say parallel map. Um, I have to make that a function. Let's do this. Um, parallel map of this. 
Uh, how did you actually implement it in finite lattice? Say that again. How did you actually implement it in finite lattice? Uh, that was what I was, that's the function there. This is a non-uniform cellular automaton with, with a, 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 this is its rules, and this is the control bits, basically, and that's the actual value. And I, I'm, I, I'm, there may be, uh, I, actually, there's probably a slightly more efficient way to do this, but this is, um, uh, this is a, I mean, sorry, it took me 10 minutes of messing around to get this. Um, I probably should have done it just using the cellular automaton function using a slightly more complicated rule um, with a function, but this is, this is sort of doing it from first principles. Um, uh, and you can see how it works here. So this is, this is, these are the control bits. This is the, um, uh, this is the actual state. And so this is keeping the control bits the same. I'm not evolving the control bits. I'm, this is an inhomogeneous, a fixed inhomogeneous cellular automaton where the control bits are fixed, but this, uh, you know, these, the, the, the actual values are changing. So I just, just for fun, let's just look at, at what the, the forms of the state transition graphs are. Uh, and by the way, I can, I can upload this notebook to the cloud. You can, you can all pick it up. It's, it's easy to do. Um, the, uh, uh, let's see, RP there. So I want to do a parallel map of this over this tuples. So I'm just, um, See if this works. Um, I'm just I'm just going to run it for these particular choices of, of rule pairs just to see whether we get any interesting forms. I mean, remember this is a very tiny size of um, uh, of lattice. And another thing I should do is to color code which of these nodes are identical. Okay, so this is this is not too exciting. Uh, I wonder what it looks like. Okay, these are not too exciting, but but um, um, you know, I could color code which nodes. Actually, this is a way to think about it. And in, in if I yeah yeah yeah, here's a, here's an interesting way to think about it. If I were to draw these graphs with the positions, I wonder if I can do this. Um, okay, so so take one of these graphs, and I can say. Um, uh, this won't be very interesting, but but um, uh, what I want to do is I want to make the inhomogeneity. So this this is now still this is going to be fairly fairly flat, but the idea would be to represent the um, uh, the kind of the values in the x y plane, and then the inhomogeneities in the z direction, so that I can get some sense of when these states are. You know which inhomogeneities, wh which states. Yeah, each one of these. Yeah, I, I see. What, what's got to happen is this: these individual subgraphs correspond to a. Okay, what, what's going to happen here is there may be multiple inhomogeneities involved in one of these subgraphs, and one, that, there's just a way to represent that. Um, anyway, that this is somebody should come to our summer school and actually do this project. And um, this is uh, I, this is this is just the five minute start, but there's a much more interesting project to do for real here. Um, but this, uh, is this is really wonderful. The it's some uh, you know I've never looked at these things before, so this is this is a uh, this is cool. Look, let me let me make sure that I can um, uh, let me upload this, publish this to the cloud, and then you should be able to get access to this notebook. Um, Let's see, let me go ahead and do that. We should probably wrap up soon because I'm going to get really tired here. It's almost almost my bedtime. The, um, yeah, sorry, yeah. it's it's early in your day, um, but late in mine. Um, yeah. So Shumit has some questions. Yeah, Shumit, can you continue? Please. Let's see, was there something in chat or was this some? Yeah, in chat, there is some question. Can, can I read out that? 
I, I, I'll, I'll find it. I can, I can see it in chat. So, um, let me. Um, but isn't it uh, very late for uh, for Sobel Frank? I think we should be probably kind of. I'll, I'll, I'll. Um. Okay. Here we go. This. Is, let me. Let me just give you. Oops. No. Let me give you this. Just for for what it's worth. Um. Uh, hold on. Uh, what did that just do? Actually, sir, we have many things to ask you. So okay, maybe hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me let me just let me just um, uh, okay. That's that notebook. If people want it, um, you, you, if you wait a few minutes, it will be cached in the cloud, um, and you can you can go go fetch it and um, play with it. Okay, let me look at these questions. Let me see if I can I can answer these questions more quickly. Uh, Okay, there's a question of, of what from uh, Fasol. Um, okay, the different elementary cellular automata, uh, in binary ECA, there are 256 rules and those lead to 256 patterns. Is there a way to have only 256 rules to get similar 256 patterns in with other kinds of rules? Okay, so I have looked at that a bit. The question is, what are, if you want a given pattern, what is the minimal rule that you need to get that pattern? So for example, I looked at that, let me show you that. Um, I looked at that, uh, let's see where that was. Um, oh gosh, where is it? Let me see. I think that that is in here. And I think it's in, is it here? So by the way, this is an interesting case. This is different cellular automata that all achieve the objective of doubling the size of their input. Okay, so they're like many different cellular automata that all in a sense do the same thing, but their rules are different. But what I was looking for is, is this it? Maybe it's this. No, no, not quite. Uh, here we go. Okay, so what this is, this is kind of interesting and deserves more study. So this is asking if you have, if you want to get a particular sequence of values on the center column, what is the minimal rule that you have to use to get that particular sequence of values? Okay. So this is, um, and uh, so so this is sort of this is sort of asking the question if you are going to get the same kinds of values as you get in an elementary cellular automaton. Uh, you know, what are the minimal, let's say, three color rules that will give you that? that that's, the, that's the kind of question one's asking there. Okay, question from Ashish here. Uh, three questions. Let's see. Okay, the question is, are there pockets of computational reducibility in the sea of computational irreducibility reducing with time? So will the heat death of the universe be a completely irreducible state? Okay, the heat death of the universe is a misunderstanding. See, what happens is people say, you've got all these atoms bouncing around and they get to the state that seems completely random to us. So we say, it's all over, it's the heat death of the universe, but that's completely wrong. The only reason the atoms look boring and like there was no structure to them is because the only thing we're measuring is something like the overall pressure of the gas. If we tracked every single molecule, we wouldn't conclude there was any heat death at all. We would just say, oh, look at all these interesting things that are happening in these, in these particular atoms. So in a sense, the idea of the heat death of the universe is given our current view of sort of the large scale structure of gases, um, you know, will we see interesting things for all time? And the answer is no. But the thing is that if we look at different features, we will continue to see interesting things. Um, but although maybe you're asking a slightly different question, I think I think um, um, actually you're, you're okay. No, you're asking a more sophisticated question. I, I apologize. You're asking the question. Uh, okay, you're asking. It's an interesting question. The um, all right. Right now we think that the gas is getting less interesting because we're looking at certain computationally reducible features of it. The question that you're asking is, I think, will the set of reducible features 
dwindle to nothing after a sufficiently long time? And the answer is I don't know, because I don't know what the set of possible reducible features is. And that's really a question of what are, what are the set of all possible perception mechanisms? And I don't yet have a way to think about that, but it's a good question, really good question. Okay, are there explanations for dark matter and dark energy in your theory of physics um, and also experimentally testable predictions? I actually wrote about that at some length. I, I wrote a blog post um, last week uh, on the first anniversary of our physics project where I explored these questions about experimental uh, implications. There's a, there's a whole bunch of experimental implications and I, I, I refer you to that rather than, rather than going through them here. Um, how is it we humans as computationally irreducible systems are, uh, in a sense, navigate this landscape of reducibility? Well, I think the fact that we can predict anything about what's going to happen is a consequence of the fact that we are, we are sort of slicing our way into these areas of reducibility. So just to give a sense of that, um, let's see. The, um, I mean, I wrote something very recently about, um, uh, where is it? Oh, this is my post about the one-year update. Um, yeah, this is a post about consciousness and its role in understanding fundamental physics and its relationship to the, this notion that we have of kind of that there is a definite thread of experience with time that turns out to kind of seep into a lot of understanding of physics. So I, I, I mentioned this. Okay. Ah, ah, uh, Ramanujam says, he's recommended a couple of highly motivated students for the summer school. Terrific, look forward to meeting them. The, um, let's see, uh, question, if a CA converges, this is from uh, uh, Manasma. Um, if a CA converges to a single point, oh, I see fixed points, has applications of computer technology. Can convergence study of elementary cellular automata be a study of convergence phenomena of nature? Can we get a better understanding of physical systems by adding non-uniformity? Yeah, we, we talked a bit about this. Um, I think this whole question about um, um, uh, um, let's see. Um, um, this, this question about um, um, Uh, fixed points and so on. Yeah, I mean, that would be an obvious thing to ask for non-uniform cellular automata. And we could kind of see a little bit of that in, uh, well, in that big picture I was making. You know, every, every rosette there, every one of these, the middle of it is a fixed point, right? So unless there's a, a cycle, so some of these we can see, uh, let, let's look in one of these particular cases. Let's look at this one here. Um, this one here, uh, Okay, so almost all of these go to fixed points. I mean, they're, yeah, they, they all, none of these seem to go to cycle. Well, th th that one goes to a cycle there, okay? But almost all of these are going to fixed points. I don't know whether that's a, that's an interesting question, whether it's more common to get fixed points within homogeneous cellular automata. Good question to answer, don't know the answer. Um, all right, let's see. Three is there an ECA rule to represent DNA evolution? Uh, don't know. I mean, the the you know DNA evolution. You know, in in the modern version of Wolfram language, there's a lot of uh, a lot of data about biosequences, a lot of capability to deal with biosequences. That would be a good place to start um, to explore that. My guess is that um, you know people believe that DNA sequences are randomly mutated. Probably that's not true, but I've never seen a good study of from all of the different pieces of the of the tree of life what you know the extent to which there's randomness or not. Um, okay, Sumit. Maximal length CAs that are finite CAs of length n, which can generate a cycle of length two to the n minus one. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Uh, special such CA is ninety prime, where the first self follows rule one fifty. Oh, that's very interesting. Cool. So what you're doing there, I have not looked at that. I hope you've published that. That's, that sounds like a very nice thing. It sounds like a very useful thing because in, for example, generating random numbers, 
you know, you want to have longer cycle lengths. You know, that's a, I, I don't know whether people have looked at this, but using inhomogeneous cellular automata as random number generators might be an interesting thing to do. And, and you're telling me here something which I, which I didn't know, which is um, that by adding just one inhomogeneous cell, effectively one weird boundary condition cell, you can make the, the thing a maximal length, uh, have maximal length. Um, let's see. Cycle structure. Cool. Um, well, so I think what you're asking here, so I made these algebraic analyses of, of cellular automata for rule 90 and things like that. I think maybe you're asking in the inhomogeneous case, it's an analog of those algebraic analyses. Um, let me think about that for a second. Uh, well, you know, usually in the algebraic analysis, the way you implement the boundary conditions with is with polynomial modulus type stuff. Um, you know, I would guess that there will be a way of doing that. There will be a way of representing inhomogeneity in the algebraic formulation. In fact, I'm sure there will be such a way. I just don't know. I mean, we could we could mess around for a while, but it's too late for me, and I'm getting too tired to be to be coherent here in, in figuring out something like that. But I think you you should be able to do that um, to get an algebraic formulation of, of that kind of thing. Um, okay, wait a minute. Actually, from experimental observations, we found that for a given n, n cell cellular automata can generate all primes as cycle lengths. Okay, can classical cellular automata do the same thing? Okay, so that brings me to something which I've long thought was interesting. So in, in the theory of iterative maps, there's this thing called Sarkovsky's theorem. And Sarkovsky's theorem, let's see if I can find, um, let, me, let me look for this, uh, particularly if I can spell Sarkovsky. Um, let's see if I can get to it from that, here we go. Okay, so, what Sarkovsky's theorem says is, if you have, in an iterated map, if you have a, uh, there's a certain sequence of periods that you can get an iterated map. And as soon as you have period length three, you have all possible other periods. So my question has been, uh, let's see, I might've had a picture here. Uh, let's see, where was it? I'm pretty sure I had a picture. Um, no, that's just iterated maps. Uh, the question is, what, uh, where is it? I'm pretty sure I had a picture um, of, of the question for different cellular, for, for, it must be around here. Let's see. Yeah, so this is asking the question, that's right. Uh, that's right. Given a particular period, one, two, three, four, whatever, does there exist an initial condition which gives that period? Which is your question of whether there is a cycle of a in a given size here. Is there a cycle of a given period? Now, I thought I had some pictures. Maybe I didn't. I thought I had some pictures of for a given. Okay, so the question is, can you generalize Sokovsky's theorem to cellular automata? And can you show that if there exists a given set of periods, there must necessarily exist certain other periods? That will be the question. So what you're telling me is something I, I certainly didn't know, that, um, uh, that you can generate all primes as cycle lengths. Didn't know that. Um, and, and that sounds like something like Sarkovsky's theorem. And it sounds like something I, I tried to prove a generalization of Sarkovsky's theorem for cellular automata. I didn't succeed. Um, I, I, I think it can be done. I just wasn't able to do it. Um, let's see. But there are so many questions. So um, okay, I think I, I think I'm gonna have to. I, I think you've got to send somebody to the summer school and have them ask the questions there and then report back. That that's a good. That would be a good scheme. Okay, let me just take a quick look if there are any that I can address quickly. Yeah, let's see. You want to send all the questions to you and you can add the letter as well. So. You're very tired, well, actually. I'm, I, th that won't happen, you know, because I, 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 as soon as I, as soon as I, I kind of leave here, I'm going to end up um, uh, having to work on something different. Let's see. Um, 
Okay, applications of uh, serial number generators. Okay, so there's a, a claim here from uh, that you've looked at rule 30 and it fails certain tests of pseudorandomness. I will be interested to see that because in all the tests we've ever done, we've never found one that failed. So, I, and, and often when we thought it had failed, the mistake was in our test and not in the rule. And, and if you found one that fails, you found something very interesting because if you found a regularity, we've never found a regularity in that sequence. So, um, So I, I would be, so that's one where if, you know, show me a piece of orphan language code that I can run on a rule 30 that will show non-randomness in the rule 30. And that will be very interesting because I've never yeah, found one it. Second is like uh, the size of uh, the rule 30 that I, we have taken as finite, not infinite. Oh, I see. Okay, fine. Yeah, that's a different thing. Yeah, right. That's a very different thing. Yeah, the infinite case is the case. Uh, by the way, I, I, I do want to mention to you guys, um, if, if you haven't seen this, since you guys are cellular automaton enthusiasts, um, oops, uh, I do recommend. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> right. Well, go try and solve it. We, we haven't yet had, I, I don't know how hard these problems are. I mean, I don't know whether these problems will take a year, a decade, a century to solve. We don't know. We don't know what methods. You know, I, I, I tried to write in this blog post about um, the different, uh, um, um, uh, you know, different approaches one might take. But um, you know, these are very much open problems. And um, I, I think a thing that is probably a good way into these problems is to look at some of them for rules other than Rule Thirty, um, and to try and see whether there are maybe rules where these same kinds of questions are a little bit easier to answer than the case of Rule Thirty. But um, uh, you know th these problems are still very much open. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, conservation laws in in cellular automata. I've studied those a bit, um, and uh, there's more to be done on those for sure. Um, let's see. I mean, I've I've looked at. Um, um, uh, I, 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 yes, I, I did discuss that in the NKS book is, is conservation laws, but a, a systematic, okay, so, so Noether's theorem for continuous conservation laws, that would be interesting to look at the analog of that in cellular automata. I'm pretty sure there is such a thing, but I wasn't able to find it. But in general, studying what kinds of, uh, of quantities are conserved is, look, what, what I did was to look at, um, let's see, I can find this for a second. Uh, I found, um, let's see, where is it? Uh, um, here we go, conserved quantities. So I, I found certain conservation laws um, in, so I was looking for what, what rules conserve, for example, uh, total, um, uh, you know, total value and things like that. But there's so much more to do with this. I mean, that, you know, studying what, uh, you know, what conservation laws exist is, is something really interesting to do. Um, okay, question, do you believe that local, cellular automata can be locally chaotic? I'm not quite sure what that means. So let me skip that. Uh, Subic is asking, Last decade, CA researchers have proposed different kinds of asynchronism, like fully asynchronous cellular automata, alpha, beta, gamma asynchronous, delay sensitive asynchronous cellular automata. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, well, look, the issue with asynchronous cellular automata is are you, okay, what I would recommend with asynchronous cellular automata, okay, is look at the multi-way case of cellular automata. I started doing just a tiny bit with this. So one thing is asynchronous where it's just random updates, but the multi-way case is looking at all possible sequences of updates. I think that will be very interesting. And I, I, I did, um, let me show you one thing we did with that. Uh, I'll show you one thing. Okay, so this is looking at, uh, where is it? Um, uh, 
Okay, this is one of our hypergraph systems. Um, where is it? Ah, Wait a minute, that's not it. Ah, uh, here we go. Okay, so this is one of our hypergraph systems made to emulate a cellular automaton. So in this case, it's completely deterministic. And, and we can look at all of our stuff with causal graphs and, and foliations and all this kind of thing. But all we have to do is add another case to the rule and this will become a non-deterministic cellular automaton. And then we can study the multi-way graph of non-deterministic cellular automata. But I, I very strongly recommend looking at that. I think it's going to be, uh, you know, the problem with asynchronous things when, when you're sort of just picking randomly is you just, you're just spraying a bunch of, of, of randomness into the system. And I think it's, it's more interesting to, I would recommend looking at this multi-way case. Um, let's see, uh, Camille. Kamalika is, is um, asking, uh, I chose rule 30 over rule 45. That's just because it doesn't have this stripy background. It's not for a good reason. Um, okay, they're both subjective but not injective. Right, finite size rule 30 is irreversible, but rule 30 is, rule 45 is reversible for odd lattice sizes. I love the fact that you guys know this stuff. This is, um, this is terrific. Um, okay, semi-reversible CAs. Let's see, the, the CAs which are reversible for all CA sizes are very simple, belonging to class two. Semi-reversible CAs and subjective but irreversible are not that simple. Do you think going from reversible towards strictly irreversible but subjective improves randomness quality? Oh boy. Um, um, I don't know. I mean, one of the issues is if you have a system which is forced to go on a, a, the longest possible cycle, that very fact that it's forced to go on the longest possible cycle probably induces some regularities. I don't entirely understand how those regularities work, but my feeling is, for example, a linear feedback shift register, a, a maximal length feedback shift register, we know that there are lots of regularities and they are probably the result of the fact that it's maximal length. But so it will be very interesting to study the relationship between maximal length and local regularities in the sequence. Uh, my intuition would be that as you get really close to maximal length, you will start getting other regularities in the sequence. Whether there is a sweet spot between, you know, longer period, but not yet hitting sort of regularity, and having something that is much more, uh, much more irreversible, I, I don't know. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, in the case of reversibility, we observe that if an ECA is reversible for some finite lattice sizes, we can predict what its irreversibility will be for infinite lattice size. Yes, that that's oh, the, 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 there's a proof of this in 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 the in the NKS book of this fact. Um, uh, of this fact that if you can, that there's a proof in, um, oh gosh, where is that? I have no idea, but, but um, um, uh, let me see. Um, okay, what's interesting about that proof is testing cellular automata four. Okay, here we go. So this is, the, the issue is, uh, Right, so this proves, this is a proof that if you test finite blocks up to a certain size, that will be sufficient to test reversibility for all sizes. That's true for one dimension, it's not true for two dimensions. In two dimensions, the, this, it's undecidable, reversibility is undecidable because you can, there, there's no way to, um, there's no upper bound on the size of block you have to test. So. Um, the, uh, um, that, that's, um, um, yeah, but I, I, I think this is, I think this is a, I mean, I, I think there's a, 
so far it's very gracefully improved at this. I, I, of course, I didn't give the proof here, which is terrible, but um, it's this is because I didn't have notes to the notes, which I sort of regret. If I'd been doing this today, where, when it would have been a website as well as a book, I would have had notes to the notes, um, but uh, I didn't have that there. Um, uh, is the problem of finding the cycle structure of an arbitrary CA MP complete? Um, I think it's P space complete, I think, uh, if I remember correctly. It's been a long time since I thought about this. I did discuss this also in the NKS book. I think the problem of inverting a cellular automaton is in general MP complete. The problem of, of finding cycle structure, I, I, I'm pretty sure is P space complete. Uh, in, in the general case of arbitrary cellular automata, whether it is that for a particular cellular automaton rule, I don't know. Um, let's see. Okay, last last thing here because I'm I'm really getting very tired. I'm afraid. Um, oh, it looks like we we got through all the questions more or less. So okay, so now I'm now I'm allowed to go to sleep. I think. Um, but uh, anyway, this this was great, and um, uh, I I'm um, uh, I. I, I didn't realize you guys were were going to ask me such detailed things about cellular automata. I, I'm uh, it's really really uh, a pleasure to hear about these things, and um, as I say, particularly this year, I you know this this year again the summer school is going to be uh, virtual, and um, uh, it's a great opportunity to to kind of um, uh, you know in in other years it's a lot of fun to meet people in person, but it's more effort to. Um, uh, to you know, to make it to to Boston or whatever uh, for the summer school, and um, uh, I think um, uh, I'd love to see some more cellular automaton um, uh, work done there. All right, I I um, um oh boy, there's even more stuff here. Last two decades, starting, many CA researchers have explored distributed system problems like leader election problems, spanning tree problem. Um, okay, most of the time. Yeah, okay, so so look, this, this point about the fact that people have found very complicated cellular automata that do things, they probably built those in an engineering way. The question of what's the minimal cellular automaton that does these things, is a really interesting one. And, and what we see, for example, we see it in the, even in the case of sorting networks, the minimal sorting network for a size 11, you know, size 11 sorting network is very complicated. The, the question of what the minimal such thing is, the, the algorithmic complexity minimum uh, program is a different question for can you construct a program for doing this? And, and that's a sort of separate issue. And um, uh, okay, look, I. I need to go to sleep, so so um, uh, um, I should sign off here. And um, thanks very much. This was this was great. And um, uh, uh, check out the notebook. Come to the summer school, and keep on studying cellular automata because there's there's an infinite amount to to learn about them. And and I, I just want to say that that um, one of the amazing things about cellular automata and even the elementary cellular automata is that you know, they're, they're minimal models. And you can be basically guaranteed that at some point in the future, if you find an interesting property of a minimal model, someday somebody's going to need that result. And, and the only challenge that we have is organizing those results well enough that people will find them when they need them. And, um, you know, I think this is something that perhaps the cellular automaton community could do a better job of is, is you know, I've, I've thought about making these various atlases of cellular automata and properties and things. I've done a little bit on that. But it's like, you know, you'll discover something this year and 20 years from now, somebody will be studying some VLSI, something or other problem. And they'll say, gosh, you know, we're going to, you know, use some elementary cellular automaton to do that. And, oh, I wonder if somebody has studied, you know, the question of uh, uh, under what circumstances are they reversible or some such other thing. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of inevitable that when you're studying these minimal models that they're going to be important at some point in the future. The only question is to make sure you write about them in a clear enough way that they can be understood later and, and found because it may not be the case. It's just like pure mathematics. You know, a bunch of the mathematics that we're using right now in our physics project, some of it is very modern, but some of it is from 100 years ago. And 
it's a question of, and that mathematics didn't get used, it didn't get applied any time from 100 years ago until now. And now we're applying it. And in some cases, it's very challenging to go find that mathematics that was quite hidden. And, and for example, the theory of combinators, you know, I, I made a big effort to understand everything that people have written about that over the last 100 years um, and to sort of uh, uh, make use of that. But, but again, it's, you know, these minimal things are inexorably important. And that's, uh, you know, that's the great thing about solar automata. All right, I need to go. Very nice to chat with you guys. And um, uh, thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much for spending so much of time with us. Yeah, I'm glad I had a chance to do it. Okay, good night. Bye bye. It's a blessing.